I had been working as a tour guide at the Tower of London for a few years. I had heard all the ghost stories, from Anne Boleyn to the Young Princes, but it was the lesser known tale of the Phantom Archer that truly unnerved me. One evening, after the last tour had ended and the sun had set, I decided to take a stroll by Traitor's Gate. This was the infamous entrance where prisoners, often high-profile traitors, were brought into the tower by boat. The water lapped gently against the stone, and the fog was beginning to roll in from the Thames. As I approached the gate, I heard the distant twang of a bowstring, followed by a soft thud. Startled, I looked around but saw no one. I continued walking, dismissing the noise as a figment of my imagination. But then it happened again. This time, I saw an arrow embedded in the ground just a few feet from me. I looked up, and to my horror, saw the silhouette of an archer on the battlements above. He was dressed in medieval garb, his face obscured by the shadows. He knocked another arrow, aiming directly at me. Panicking, I ducked behind a stone pillar just as the arrow whizzed past, narrowly missing me. I peeked out, trying to locate the archer, but he had vanished. The next day, I spoke to an elderly colleague about the incident. His face looked concerned and ashen as he recounted the legend of the Phantom Archer. Centuries ago, a skilled archer named Arvind had been falsely accused of treason and imprisoned in the tower. Swearing his innocence, he vowed to haunt the tower until his name was cleared. Ever since, on foggy nights, the Phantom Archer is said to appear, practicing his aim and searching for the one who betrayed him. I had always been an avid photographer, and the Tower of London was a gold mine for capturing the essence of England's history. One day, I decided to focus on the Beecham Tower, known for its graffiti carved by prisoners. As I set up my equipment, the atmosphere grew heavy, and the room became eerily silent. I began to hear soft footsteps echoing through the chamber. Thinking it was another visitor, I looked around but the room was empty. The footsteps grew louder, moving closer to where I stood. I could feel my heart racing as I tried to locate the source. Suddenly, the footsteps stopped right behind me. I turned around, half expecting to see someone, but there was no one there. Later, I learned about Thomas Beecham, the Earl of Warwick, who was imprisoned in the tower that bore his name. Legend has it that he roams the tower, restless and seeking justice for his unjust imprisonment. A webcam isn't the most sophisticated piece of technology for capturing celestial phenomena, but sometimes low-tech is all you have. It was my only option for monitoring the sky while working a tedious security job at a remote power plant. Mostly, the webcam caught passing clouds, birds, or the occasional plane. Not groundbreaking stuff, but it broke the monotony. But one night, something was off. I felt it before I saw it, like static in the air, a heightened sense of tension I couldn't shake. It prickled the back of my neck as I stared at the computer screen, the live feed displaying an inky sky punctuated by stars. And then they appeared, objects, fast, erratic, and too numerous to count, darting across the sky. Blink and you'd miss them, but once you noticed you couldn't unsee them. They were dubbed fast walkers in the amateur astronomy community, but these were faster and smaller than any description I had ever read. My breath caught as I immediately hit the button to record the feed. 
the fast walkers continued their chaotic dance, spiraling, zigzagging, defying the laws of physics and aerodynamics. Too fast for birds, too erratic for any known aircraft. As I squinted into the screen, they seemed to pulse, as if emitting some sort of energy or light. When it was over, the sky returned to its dormant state, an empty stage after the performers had taken their final bow. I sat there, pulse still racing, cursor hovering over the saved file. Could it be a glitch? A camera malfunction? Deep down, I knew it wasn't. The footage was transferred onto a thumb drive, then uploaded into every cloud account I owned. It needed to be shared, analyzed, scrutinized. There was something that shattered the status quo, a glitch in the matrix of our everyday reality. I didn't sleep that night. How could I? I replayed the footage over and over, each viewing deepening my sense of awe and dread. This was beyond me beyond any conventional explanation. I needed to know more. Expert opinions varied, from dismissive scorn to hushed incredulity. Frame by frame, analysis showed no editing, no tampering. The fast walkers remained an enigma, data points that didn't fit into any existing models. And as the footage made its way through forums, YouTube channels, and even into the databases of researchers willing to venture outside the mainstream, I became an unwitting ambassador to a mystery that defied explanation. As weeks turned into months, the chatter faded. More pressing news, more immediate concerns, overshadowed my celestial mystery. Yet my footage remained, stored, archived, waiting for the day when it could be slotted into a narrative that made sense. Life resumed its normalcy, the power plant hummed along. My shifts continued in their repetitive cycle, but I wasn't the same. Every night I watched the sky, webcam forever recording, half in anticipation, half in dread of another visit. I became a familiar face in online forums dedicated to the unexplained. My story became one of many, remarkable but not unique in a world brimming with inexplicable phenomena. I found a strange comfort in this community of seekers each with their own tale, each touched by the same elusive mystery. The sky above me remains a canvas of potential, a window into an unknown realm. But even as the questions linger, unanswered, I can't escape the conviction that what I captured that night wasn't random. It was a brief, frenetic intersection of two realities, ours and something else. Something that flits at the edge of perception, the darts through the gaps in our understanding, as elusive as it is undeniable. As I stare at my screen tonight, the sky empty yet full of stars, I find myself straddling two worlds, the one I live in, and the one I glimpse in stolen, breathtaking moments. And as I reach out to adjust the focus on my humble webcam, I can't shake the feeling that somewhere, in a distant, unknown expanse, I'm being watched in return. Back in the day, my job was at a rural elementary school, teaching a bunch of first and second graders. Little humans full of energy and imagination, that's why, at first, I didn't give too much credence to their chatter about the silver ball in the sky during recess. Kids have vivid imaginations, after all. But the consistency of their stories had an unnerving edge. They all talked about how the ball hovered, silent, and then zipped away at an angle that no airplane could manage. But kids will be kids, and I put it out of my mind. Until art class the following week. The assignment was simple. Draw something you saw this week that made you happy. Standard fare to let them express themselves. As they eagerly scratched away with their crayons, I walked among them, offering the occasional praise or guidance. That's when I saw the first drawing. Alien creatures with large eyes, 
elongated limbs, standing beside what was unmistakably a saucer-shaped object. I frowned, but before I could ask about it, I saw another drawing. A different child, a different part of the room, but the same entities, the same saucer. My stomach tightened as I hurriedly scanned the room. There were 14 students, and by the time I had made my circuit, I counted no less than eight drawings depicting the same beings next to similar UFOs. Each was rendered in the childish scrawl of Cran, but the uniformity was chilling. Trying to maintain composure, I asked the class, Wow, you guys really let your imaginations run wild, huh? Can anyone tell me more about these space friends? One of the boys, Jeremy, piped up. They're not from our imaginations, Miss Simmons. They're from the playground. They waved at us. The room seemed to shrink, walls closing in as other kids nodded in agreement. They had long fingers, added Lisa, another student. They didn't talk, but I heard them in my head. They said they're just visiting. My throat felt like sandpaper. I encouraged the children to explain more, grasping for some plausible explanation, maybe a shared dream or some group fantasy. But their accounts were stark in their agreement, down to the details like the way their space friends floated rather than walked, how their mouths didn't move, but thoughts were implanted directly into their minds. That night, I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw those crayon drawings, the long limbs, the big eyes, the saucer-like crafts. I found myself wrestling with the absurdity and the terror of it. How could children, at their level of emotional and cognitive development, construct such a consistent, intricate falsehood? Plus, none of them knew I was going to give them that assignment, and all of them, without really looking at each other, drew the same thing. By morning, my decision was made. I gathered the drawings and took them to the principal. Mr. Jacobs didn't know whether to laugh or call for a psych evaluation of his teaching staff. Yet, his eyes narrowed as he looked through the stack of drawings. This is unusual, he finally said, in a voice that betrayed an unease he didn't want to acknowledge. Parents were called, meetings were held. Officially, the incident was chalked up to mass hysteria fueled by childish imagination. The art assignment was repeated a week later, this time yielding an assortment of family portraits, pets, and superheroes. No saucers, no extraterrestrial beings with elongated limbs and large eyes. But something had shifted, something intangible. Recess became a quieter affair, the kids clustered together more closely, their laughter a bit more subdued, their glances toward the sky more frequent. In staff meetings, the event turned into an inside joke, a way for overworked educators to lighten the mood. But not for me. I couldn't shake the conviction that something extraordinary had touched the lives of those children, leaving a mark on their consciousness that wasn't going to leave anytime soon. As for me, I found myself scanning the skies more often, at recess, on my drive home, from my backyard, looking for something I couldn't define, couldn't dismiss. I never saw anything, but the search itself became a ritual, a silent vigil fueled by a mystery that refused to be forgotten. The years passed, the kids moved on. I eventually left the teaching profession, driven by a need for change, a need to explore beyond the boundaries of a rural schoolyard. But those drawings remain with me, filed away, yet never far from thought, a haunting mosaic of crayon and mystery, of innocence touched by the inexplicable. And as each day ends, as I find myself inevitably drawn to the horizon where sky meets earth, I am reminded of the questions that still linger, unanswered, in the echoing silence of a playground forever changed.
In a remote Japanese village of Koyasan, tucked away among misty mountains and ancient cedar forests, lies a mailbox unlike any other. It stands next to a small Shinto shrine, unremarkable in appearance, but extraordinary in its story. For the past several decades, every year on the same day, this mailbox receives a letter. The handwriting is delicate, the words penned in classical Japanese, the prose steeped in poetic nuance. What makes this phenomenon inexplicable isn't just the content, but the context. These letters bear current date stamps, but they are addressed from a woman named Yuki to her lover Hiroshi, both of whom, according to the text, lived in the 1500s. They speak of love and war, of seasons changing and empires falling, as if plucked from a time long past, yet mailed in the present. I stumbled upon this tale while in Japan for a research project. Intrigued by the blend of romance and mystery, I decided to visit Koyasan. I was there on the day the next letter was due to arrive, waiting beside the mailbox with a mixture of skepticism and anticipation. At precisely noon, the postman came by on his bicycle, dropping a single envelope into the mailbox before pedaling away, seemingly unaware of his role in this mystery. The villagers, who had long accepted this occurrence as a quirk of their secluded community, graciously allowed me to examine the letter. The paper was fine washy, its texture betraying nothing of its age or origin. The date stamp was crisp and contemporary, jarringly at odds with the archaic kanji script describing cherry blossoms and samurai battles. I read the letter over and over, captivated by the raw emotion and historical detail within its lines. Yuki spoke of a warlord who had recently swept through their region, of the ache she felt with Hiroshi away, likely drafted into this new conflict. It ended with a plea for them to be reunited, if not in this life, then in the next, beneath the same cherry blossoms they had admired together. Who were Yuki and Hiroshi? Why were their letters manifesting in our time? The villagers had theories, mostly involving spirits or unfulfilled destinies, but no one knew for sure. While my rational mind sought a logical explanation, perhaps a skilled and dedicated hoaxer or an elaborate cultural performance, another part of me resonated with the emotive prose, the depth of feeling that spanned centuries. Could love indeed be so powerful as to puncture the fabric of time? My stay in Koyasan eventually came to an end, and I returned to my world of academic rigor and deadlines. But the story of Yuki and Hiroshi lingers in my thoughts, a love letter to the enigmatic and the unexplained. Every so often, when the weight of the present becomes too oppressive, I find myself drifting back to that mist-shrouded village, to the mailbox that serves as a portal to another time. It remains a mystery without a key, a question without an answer, yet its very existence is a testament to the enduring, perhaps even transcendent nature of human emotion a love so profound that it defies the boundaries of time. The house was a deal too good to pass up, an old Victorian slightly worn around the edges but full of character situated on a quiet street lined with mature trees. Sarah and I felt an immediate connection, an unspoken agreement passing between us the moment we stepped inside. We moved in within the month. Could use a fresh coat of paint, Sarah said, her voice bouncing off the empty walls. I laughed, and then a second later heard another laugh, a soft, hollow replication that settled uneasily in the room. Not my laugh, not Sarah's. We exchanged glances but shrugged it off. Weeks rolled on. We unpacked painted walls, filled rooms with furniture and photographs. Yet the echo remained. If we laughed, it laughed, just moments too late. 
If we raised our voices, the house seemed to speak back in a tone that was never quite ours. It's old, I rationalized. Old houses have quirks. Sarah looked unconvinced but nodded. Yeah, quirks, let's go with that. Days turned into weeks. The echo became an invisible tenant, woven into the fabric of our daily lives. But as time passed, it grew less mimetic and more distinct, its timber deepening, its laughter souring into something like a jeer. It's not normal, Dave, Sarah finally admitted one night. We need to find out what it is. I nodded, my gut echoing her unease. We started with simple tests, trying to catch the echo off guard, determine its origin, shouting into empty rooms, recording the spaces with our phones. But every recording played back clean, as if the echo refused to be caught. Frustrated, we invited an acoustics expert to assess the house. He walked through each room, taking measurements, scratching his head. The structure's sound, no reason for any sort of echo, he declared, packing his gear, and certainly not the kind you described. Yet the echo persisted, growing louder with each passing day. In an act of last resort, we brought in a medium, a small woman with graying hair and a face etched with lines of experience. She walked through the house, pausing in the living room where the echo was strongest. Closing her eyes, she said, there's another layer to this house, another skin. It's trying to communicate, but it's trapped between worlds. Can you free it? Sarah asked, her voice tinged with desperation. The medium shook her head. No, but you need to leave. It's growing stronger with your presence, feeding off your emotions. We didn't need any more convincing. We moved out within the week, finding a modern apartment devoid of echoes or invisible tenants. The old house was left behind, but the echo has never really left us. It's become a yardstick of the unexplainable, a reminder that some walls don't just hold up a roof, they hold secrets too profound for our understanding. It taught us to listen, not just to the noises that fill a space, but to the silence that seeks to speak, to the echo that isn't our own but yearns to be heard. Havana has its own rhythm, a pulsating beat that thrives in the narrow alleys, the crowded cafes, and the colorful facades that line its streets. But beyond the city, where the sand meets the Caribbean Sea, there's a different kind of music, a melody that belongs to the night, and to the folklore that resides in the collective memory of the locals. I was drawn to it, this phenomenon that everyone spoke of but few outsiders had experienced. I took to the beach just before midnight, a bottle of rum in my hand, a cigar in my pocket, and an air of skepticism swirling around me. The moon hung like a silver crescent in the ink-black sky, casting a soft glow on the water. Waves lapped lazily at the shore, their white foam fizzling out as they retreated. I settled on a driftwood log, eyes on the horizon, ears attuned to the natural symphony of the sea. Then, as the clock hands united in their midnight embrace, it happened. A melody wafted through the salty air, a haunting tune plucked on an invisible guitar. The sound was ethereal yet precise, as if each note were being played with calculated affection. It seemed to rise from the depths of the ocean, filling the space between the sea and the stars. The locals, they told of a pirate, a corsair from the golden age of sail, who'd met his tragic end on these shores. Shipwrecked and separated from his beloved, he'd drowned in a storm while clutching a golden locket, a last memento of his lost love. They said this melody was his spirit's serenade, a nocturnal tribute that soared over the waters he'd perished in. 
I sat there, wrapped in the musical veil, transported by its otherworldly beauty. Each chord struck resonated with a mix of sorrow and yearning, as if the pirate spirit was bearing its soul, reliving a love that could never be reclaimed yet refused to be forgotten. As abruptly as it started, the melody ceased. The sounds of the ocean rushed back in, reclaiming their dominion. But the atmosphere had changed. The beach felt fuller, as though it had been momentarily inhabited by a presence that transcended human lifetimes, an emotion that defied the constraints of language. I left the beach that night with more than grains of sand clinging to my shoes. I carried away the echo of a melody, the ghost of a story, and a newfound respect for the thin membrane that separates the explainable from the mysterious. In a land known for its vibrant music, its lively dances, and its rich history, that midnight melody stands apart, a haunting refrain that links the past to the present, folklore to reality, and above all love to loss. The locals may attribute it to a pirate's restless spirit, but to me it represents something more universal, the enduring power of love and music to transcend the boundaries of time and death, forever imprinted on the canvas of the Cuban beach, forever echoing in the chambers of the heart. a wildland firefighter back in the day in Arizona. I worked in a forest that was generally popular with a lot of recreation in the northern portion, but I worked on the southern portion of the forest that was really remote. It barely had any roads or campgrounds, so if you wanted to recreate there, you had to work for it. The fire crew I was on had two duty stations one in a small town where the rest of the forest employees worked out of, and one that was about two and a half hours away, up a really windy mountainous road. The remote duty station had an old forest service ranger station and a newer double wide trailer that was recently put in. When I worked at this place, it had no cell reception. When my crew and I weren't working, we were playing horseshoes and watching movies. They did eventually add a cell phone booster, which sadly made people play on their phones, but I digress. So for my creepy story, I wanted to keep it pretty simple. But my supervisor from that crew had experienced some weird things as well working up there. There was one night he told me he was cowboy camping, which means sleeping outside with no tent and he kept getting a weird mucusy drop of liquid on his face. He kept looking around and even yelling, but no one was around him. He told me he wasn't below any trees, so it wasn't sap, but he never slept outside there again, which leads me to believe he was telling the truth. For my story, I have had other interesting experiences at that remote duty station, but this one was scary. It was the night of July 4th, and we weren't on a fire, so the crew was playing horseshoes and having a good time. Everyone went to bed pretty early, because we were going to have a PT hike the next day. I had my own small room in the double wide trailer, and my bed was situated next to a big window. I started dozing off, but felt awake still, and I heard one of my coworkers outside my window asking me to come outside. I was laying on my side facing the window, and I didn't look up, but I felt their presence by the window. It felt as though something tall was looming over me from outside. They kept beckoning me, and I said no. Pretty quickly, their voice started changing to a deeper, raspier, angrier voice. They started cursing at me, get the heck outside. I just froze. It was sort of a demonic voice. I just lay frozen, 
not moving while they yelled at me. Eventually it stopped and somehow I fell asleep. I woke up the next day and I wanted to ask my coworker if he was standing outside my window, but it felt too weird to ask. Perhaps this was a mild form of sleep paralysis, but whatever it was, it's still weird. I had always been captivated by Nevada's rugged beauty, its juxtaposition of barren deserts and bustling cities. When I finally bought a small ranch-style home in a secluded area near Carson City, I felt like I was fulfilling a dream. I was told by the previous owner that the house had character, a term I initially took to mean its rustic charm and decades-old architecture. Within a few days of moving in, however, I started to notice some odd occurrences. It began with flickering lights in the hallway and kitchen. Probably just old wiring, I thought. But then I'd hear footsteps on the wooden floors at night, when I was sure I was alone. One evening, I was in my home office, flipping through some paperwork. Suddenly, I felt an inexplicable drop in temperature. Just as I was about to shrug it off, I heard a loud crash from the living room. I rushed in to find a vase that had been sitting on the mantel, now shattered on the floor. No windows were open, nothing else was out of place. Unsettled, I began talking to locals about the house's history. That's when I learned about its former occupant, a reclusive man named Charles, who had died under mysterious circumstances many years ago. Some said he was involved in the occult. Others insisted he had been a harmless, if somewhat peculiar, loner. What everyone agreed on was that he had been deeply attached to the house. Determined to get to the bottom of the haunting, I set up cameras around the house and an audio recorder in the living room where most of the disturbances seemed to occur. For days, I captured nothing out of the ordinary. But one night, as I was reviewing the audio, I heard it, a faint whisper saying, get out. I felt a chill run down my spine, but refused to be scared out of my own home. I decided to confront the entity directly. Armed with a sense of resolve, I stood in the middle of the living room and spoke. Charles, if that's you, I mean you no harm. We can coexist peacefully in this house. The room went cold. I felt a rush of air pass by me, like a sigh of relief. From that moment on, the disturbances ceased. No more flickering lights, no more footsteps, no more broken vases, of which there had been many. However, every so often, I still feel a cold spot in the house or hear very faint footsteps, as if Charles is reminding me of his presence. I've come to think of him as the house's guardian spirit, an unseen roommate in our shared living space. And so I continue to reside in my home, cohabitating with a spectral presence that, like the stark Nevada landscape, has its own kind of haunting beauty. We live in a delicate balance, a mutual understanding that has turned a haunted house into a home. The house still has character, but now I understand what that truly means. It's a place where the veil between the living and the dead seems thinner, a place where the past refuses to be completely forgotten, a place that both Charles and I call home. I had heard the stories about Il Dipinto Maledetto, the cursed painting, 
long before I decided to visit Sforza Castle in Milan. I was a freelance art historian with a penchant for the eerie and the strange. The castle, an imposing structure built in the 15th century, was the perfect blend of history and mystery. After maneuvering through the cobblestone streets of Milan, I finally found myself at the castle's grand entrance. Inside, the courtyards and towers sprawled in a labyrinthine layout, and the walls seemed to reverberate with the whispers of bygone eras. I had specifically come to see the art collections, especially the works of the Italian Renaissance. As I made my way through the castle's museums, an elderly guide named Signora Bianchi noticed my intense focus on the paintings. She approached and began a conversation. Ah, a connoisseur, she said, smiling. Would you like to see something unique? I was intrigued. Of course. Follow me, she said, leading me down a lesser known corridor. There is one painting that we rarely show to the public, for it has a strange tale attached to it. She paused in front of an unassuming wooden door. Unlocking it, she guided me into a dimly lit room where a single painting hung on the wall, veiled by a curtain. She drew the curtain aside. Behold, Il Dipinto Maladetto. The painting was hauntingly beautiful, depicting a young woman with melancholic eyes. Her gaze seemed to follow you, lending her an eerily lifelike quality. Signora Bianchi proceeded to tell me the local legend. The painting was created by an obscure artist who was infatuated with the woman depicted. However, she did not reciprocate his feelings and tragically passed away under mysterious circumstances. Brokenhearted and distraught, the artist is said to have imbued the painting with his soul, cursing it forever. It's believed the painting brings misfortune to anyone who stares into the eyes of the woman for too long, she warned. I chuckled, half amused and half skeptical. An intriguing story, to be sure. Ah, the skepticism of youth, she sighed. But beware, many have felt a strange melancholy after looking into her eyes, and some have even claimed to see the figure in their dreams. As I turned back to the painting, our eyes locked. For a fleeting moment, I felt an overwhelming sense of sorrow, as if her emotions were flowing into me. Shaking off the sensation, I thanked Signora Bianchi and left the room, attributing my feelings to the power of suggestion. That night, however, I was plagued by vivid dreams of the woman in the painting. She seemed to beckon me, her eyes filled with an unspeakable sadness. The next morning, I couldn't shake off the eerie experience. Whether it was the product of an overactive imagination or something more inexplicable, the cursed painting had etched its story onto my consciousness. I returned to the museum, not to debunk the tale, but to pay my respects to the artistry that could evoke such powerful emotions. As I stood before Il Dipinto Maledetto one final time, I felt humbled by the realization that some stories, whether folklore or fact, are destined to remain a mystery. And in that gray area between skepticism and belief, I found an uncanny form of beauty that defied simple explanations. Sforza Castle continued to be a symbol of Milan's rich history, but for me it became a place where art and legend coalesced into a compelling, haunting narrative, one that I would carry with me long after I left the castle's ancient walls. I work as a night guard at Alcatraz Island, the infamous former prison located in San Francisco Bay. Alcatraz has been many things, a military fortification, a military prison, and later a maximum security federal penitentiary. But for the last several decades, it has stood as a tourist attraction, a place where people can come and glimpse the darker aspects of human history. When you work the night shift at a place like Alcatraz, 
you encounter stories of hauntings, whispers of Al Capone playing his banjo in the shower room, or cries of prisoners long gone still echoing in the cells. These stories didn't bother me much. I've never been the superstitious type, and years on the job made me familiar, almost comfortable with the island's grim ambiance. However, local folklore speaks of something else, a figure known as the Lone Wanderer. Unlike the hauntings that are confined to the cells and specific locations within the prison, this entity is said to wander around the island. The legend goes that he was a prisoner who loved the sea. During his sentence, he was a well-behaved inmate and earned the right to do some gardening as a daytime job. They say he was plotting an escape, intending to swim across the bay, but he was caught and thrown into solitary confinement where he passed away, never seeing the open ocean again. The lone wanderer, they say, still roams the island at night, searching for his lost chance at freedom. One evening, a thick fog rolled in over the Bay Area. The fog in San Francisco is different. It's thicker, almost palpable, like you could grab a handful if you tried. That night, I was doing my usual rounds, walking with my flashlight and radio. The tourists had long since departed, and it was just me and the echoes of my footsteps. I reached the gardens, the place where, according to legend, the lone wanderer used to work. I don't know if it was the fog or the solitude, but something felt off. The air was denser, and I had a peculiar feeling of being watched. That's when I heard it. Footsteps. Not my own, but another set, faint and inconsistent, as if hesitating. I shined my flashlight in the direction of the sound, but it revealed nothing. Unease crawled up my spine, but I convinced myself it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I continued my rounds until I reached the edge of the island that faced the open sea, where the fog was now so thick I could barely see a few feet in front of me. And that's when I saw him. A figure, indistinct but unmistakably human, standing at the edge, looking out toward the ocean. For a moment, I froze. My radio, my flashlight, they all seemed irrelevant. The figure stood there for what felt like an eternity, but was probably just a few seconds. And then, as quietly as he appeared, he walked away, dissipating into the fog. I stood there, my heart pounding, both terrified and fascinated. Was it the lone wanderer? I can't say for sure. What I do know is that I felt an unexplainable sense of sorrow, tinged with a freedom I've never felt before. A freedom that can only come when you're so close to achieving something you've yearned for, but are held back at the final moment. The next day I went through the security footage but found nothing. No signs of anyone walking the island. I've continued my nightly rounds since then, occasionally standing at the edge, looking out into the sea, contemplating the story of the Lone Wanderer. Even today when the fog rolls in and the atmosphere turns heavy, I can't help but feel a presence, an entity bound by longing and unfulfilled wishes. I haven't seen him again, but I often wonder, does he find solace in his eternal solitary walks, or is he forever haunted by the sea he can never touch? I'm not one to believe in ghost stories, but the night I spent at the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California, shifted my stance just a tad. You see, I'm a history grad student, and my research often involves studying architectural eccentricities and what they reveal about the zeitgeist of a particular era. Naturally, the Winchester House had been on my list. According to local folklore, Sarah Winchester, the widow of William Wirt Winchester, of the famous rifle manufacturing company, built the house in a never-ending maze-like design 
to appease and confuse the spirits of those killed by Winchester rifles. Construction continued 24-7 until her death, resulting in a labyrinthine mansion with doors that led to nowhere, staircases that ended abruptly, and hallways that twisted in maddening directions. My advisor somehow managed to arrange for me to stay overnight in the mansion to immerse myself in the ambience for an upcoming paper. Armed with my notebook and a flashlight, I was led into the grand ballroom with its Tiffany glass windows and ornate wooden panels, where I'd be spending the night. Around midnight, as I was jotting down observations about the intricate cornices and wainscoting, I heard it. Soft footsteps in the hallway. I initially brushed it off as the house settling. This place was old, after all. But then I heard a door creak open, followed by a delicate murmur that seemed to be a soft tune, or perhaps a lament. My heart quickened. Was it a nocturnal tour? Maybe. Curiosity outweighing my apprehension, I left the ballroom and stepped into the hallway. I walked cautiously through the maze, each turn seemingly taking me further from my point of origin. It felt as if the house was absorbing me. Then I arrived at the seance room, where it said Sarah Winchester communicated with spirits for building instructions. The air inside felt thick and charged. I felt a subtle but definite pull towards the room. As I stepped inside, I saw the most extraordinary thing. Three wooden planchettes, commonly used in spirit boards, slowly moving on a table by themselves, forming what seemed like letters. My skepticism battled with the evidence before me, but before I could take a closer look, a cold gust of wind blew through the room, scattering the planchettes. I ran back to the ballroom, retracing my steps as best as I could, and locked myself in for the night. Come morning, I thanked the caretaker and left, my notebook teeming with more questions than answers. People say Sarah Winchester built a house to confuse spirits, but I can't help but wonder if she ended up capturing them instead, in its endless hallways and mysterious rooms. Whether the experience was a figment of my imagination, or a brush with the other side, it left me with a newfound respect for folklore. So here I am, back at my desk, piecing together the history of a house that defies all architectural logic with an anecdote that defies all scientific reason. Will it make its way into my academic paper? Probably not. But it will certainly stay in my mind as the night the Winchester Mystery House turned me, if only for a fleeting moment, into a believer. I was sitting on the balcony, a cup of coffee in hand, watching the sun sink behind the city skyline. The buildings cast long shadows, their outlines turning to silhouettes against the fading light. It was a moment of stillness, one I had learned to treasure in a life otherwise filled with noise and haste. That's when it happened. Without warning, the sky began to deform. Towers bent at impossible angles and skyscrapers folded over like they were made of paper. The city compressed in on itself, the whole panorama turning into a surreal, collapsing accordion. My coffee cup slipped from my hand, crashing onto the floor, but I hardly noticed. I was too fixated on the impossible sight before me. It was as if reality itself was being manipulated, the natural laws governing time and space summarily dismissed. Buildings that should have been miles apart were suddenly adjacent, then overlapping, then melding into a singular twisted mass. Roads, bridges, entire neighborhoods swallowed up, leaving behind an unrecognizable jumble of architecture and negative space. My heart raced, my mind struggling to process what my eyes were seeing. I gripped the railing, knuckles white, 
half expecting the balcony to fold into the nightmare landscape. But then, as quickly as it had started, the city snapped back to its original form. Skyscrapers untangled themselves, roads stretched back to their proper lengths, and everything returned to its normal state, as if nothing had happened. Except it had. I had seen it. The twisted shapes, the melding of structures, the complete disregard for the laws of physics. They were imprinted on my memory, a scar on my understanding of the world. I retreated inside, locking the sliding door behind me. My eyes darted around the room, half expecting the walls to start folding. But nothing happened. Everything was as it should be, or at least appeared to be. I grabbed my phone, texting friends, posting on social media, desperate to find someone else who had seen what I had. But no one responded with anything other than confusion or concern for my well-being. Days passed. I found myself unable to step back onto the balcony, fearful of what I might witness. I buried myself in work, in social commitments, in anything that could distract me from that unexplainable moment. But the city had other plans. It started with little things, street signs displaying gibberish, buildings appearing shorter or taller than they should be, the city map occasionally glitching out on my phone. Each occurrence was brief, easy to dismiss as a fluke or a trick of the light. Yet they kept happening, each anomaly chipping away at my sense of reality, reminding me that something was fundamentally wrong. And so I find myself here, writing this down both as a record and a warning. I don't know what caused the city to fold or why I was the only one to witness it. I don't know if it was a glitch in the fabric of reality or something more sinister. But I do know this. The skyline is not what it seems. It's a facade, a mask hiding something we're not meant to see. And now that I've glimpsed what's behind it, I can't shake the feeling that it's only a matter of time before the mask falls away completely. What happens then, I don't know. But as I sit here, staring out at the city that was once my home, I can't escape the terrifying thought that one day the skyline will fold again, and this time, it won't unfold. So I watch and wait, my eyes never straying too far from those towering silhouettes, wondering when they'll make their next move and what that move will mean for all of us who live in the shadow of their hidden instability. Until then, the skyline remains, a distorted reflection of a reality I no longer trust, but have no choice but to inhabit. The basement had always been a place of mystery in our old family home. Growing up, it was the realm of forgotten relics, dusty boxes, and childhood dares. But as an adult, tasked with clearing out the house after my parents decided to downsize, the basement became a chore. One afternoon, as I sifted through boxes of old photographs and trinkets, I stumbled upon an old tape recorder. It was heavy its plastic casing yellowed with age. Curiosity peaked, I pressed play, expecting to hear a forgotten family memory, or perhaps one of my childhood attempts at recording a radio show. Instead, a chilling voice filled the room. It was a man's voice, shaky and filled with desperation. Please, if anyone finds this, I need help. They're keeping me here. I don't know how much longer I can hold on. The message ended abruptly, replaced by static. My heart raced, a cold sweat forming on my brow. The voice was unfamiliar, and the sheer terror in it was palpable. I immediately contacted the local police. They took the tape recorder, and after analyzing the recording, they began an investigation. The house had been in our family for generations and no one could recall any incident or person that might be connected to the voice on the tape. Weeks turned into months, and the mystery deepened. The police were unable to identify the man or determine when the recording was made. 
The tape itself was old, but without a specific date or more information, leads were scarce. Determined to find answers, I began my own investigation. I scoured local newspapers and archives, looking for any mention of missing persons or mysterious events connected to our home. My search led me to a series of articles from the 1970s about a local man who had vanished without a trace. The man's photo bore a striking resemblance to a young version of a neighbor I remembered from my childhood, Mr. Grayson. I approached Mr. Grayson with my findings, and after some initial hesitation, he revealed a tale. In his youth, he had been involved with a group that dabbled in the dark side of the occult. Drawn in by the allure of forbidden knowledge, he soon found himself in over his head. The group, led by a charismatic but unhinged leader, believed in harnessing the energy of fear. Mr. Grayson had been chosen as their sacrifice, imprisoned and tormented to feed their dark rituals. One fateful night, he managed to escape recording his plea on a tape recorder he found in the basement. He hid the recorder, hoping that somebody would find it and rescue him. But by the time he emerged from his hiding place, the group had disbanded, its members disappearing into the shadows. Traumatized, Mr. Grayson moved away, changed his identity, and tried to forget the past. He returned years later, believing the group was long gone and that he could find some semblance of peace. The revelation sent shockwaves through our community. The police reopened the investigation, and with Mr. Grayson's testimony, they were able to track down and apprehend the remaining members of the group. The tape recorder, once a forgotten relic, had unveiled a dark chapter in our town's history. It served as a haunting reminder of the secrets that can lurk beneath the surface, hidden in the shadows of the past, waiting for the light of truth to reveal them. Our family road trips were always filled with laughter, games, and of course music. My wife, Aisha, our two kids, Maya and Sami and I, were on a summer drive through the heart of Virginia, heading towards the Blue Ridge Mountains. The landscape was picturesque, with rolling hills and dense forests flanking the highway. As we drove, I decided to scan the local radio stations, hoping to find some classic rock or perhaps a catchy pop tune. But what we stumbled upon was something entirely unexpected. The radio tuned into a station, WVLR Memories 88.9, and a soft, melodic song began to play. The lyrics spoke of a summer romance at a county fair, of stolen glances atop a Ferris wheel, and whispered promises under a starlit sky. Aisha suddenly gasped. I remember this that summer when we went to the county fair in Roanoke. We had our first kiss on the Ferris wheel. She looked at me with teary eyes, lost in the memory. But there was a problem. Aisha and I had never been to a county fair in Roanoke. We'd met in college in New York and had never visited Virginia until now. Before I could voice my confusion, another song began. This one was upbeat, detailing a family picnic by a lakeside with children laughing and playing in the water. Maya and Sammy's eyes lit up. That's like the time we went to Lake Anna and had that huge water balloon fight, Sammy exclaimed. Again, this was a memory that didn't exist. We'd never been to Lake Anna. Song after song, the radio played tunes that evoked memories we hadn't lived. There was the winter ballad that reminded Aisha of a snowy dance we'd never attended and the rock anthem that brought back memories of a concert where Maya had supposedly gotten her first guitar pick. The atmosphere in the car grew thick with a mix of nostalgia and confusion. It was as if the radio was tapping into an alternate timeline, playing songs from moments that had never occurred in our lives, but felt as real as any other memory. As the sun set, the signal began to fade and the mysterious WVLR Memories 88.9 was replaced by static. 
We drove in silence, each of us lost in our thoughts, trying to make sense of the phantom memories. We reached our destination, a cozy cabin in the mountains, but the events of the drive dominated our conversations. We speculated about the nature of memories, parallel universes, and the power of music to evoke emotions. That night, as the kids slept, and Aisha and I sat on the porch, looking up at the stars, she whispered, even if those memories aren't real, they felt beautiful. It's like we got a glimpse into another life, another version of us. I nodded, wrapping my arm around her. Maybe in some other universe, those memories are real. And that version of us is reminiscing about our memories, wondering about a life where they met in New York and took road trips through Virginia. We laughed at the thought, but the magic of the forgotten playlist stayed with us. It was a reminder of the infinite possibilities of life, the countless paths not taken, and the beautiful moments that exist, whether we've lived them or not. The night was moonless and bitterly cold as I steered my rattling old car down the deserted back road. It was a shortcut I'd taken for years, but tonight the wind howled through dead trees with unusual menace. According to local legend, on certain winter nights like this, a phantom highway would appear branching off from this road, leading drivers to their doom. Though I brushed off such tales, a shiver ran through me as I squinted into the dark. Sure enough, my headlights suddenly illuminated a cracked asphalt path I'd never noticed before. A weathered sign read, Ghost Highway, enter at your own peril. An icy chill rippled through me. This must be the haunted road described fearfully by the townsfolk. Those who entered were never heard from again. Clearly, some force or entity lured travelers to their ends down this sinister passage. I hesitated gripped by both unease and morbid curiosity. The phantom road awaited, daring me to uncover its secrets, or sealing my fate. Curiosity won out, and I turned onto the crumbling pavement. My tires rumbled as if passing through a barrier between worlds. Instantly, fog rolled in, obscuring the way ahead. I drove slowly, squinting through the white veil that enveloped the car. The stories of this coast highway echoed in my mind. In Japan, a similar mist-shrouded road allegedly led to the realm of the deed, never allowing any to return to the land of the living. In Ireland, a phantom path was said to carry victims away, to be sacrificed to ancient pagan gods. What horrors awaited down this forsaken route? Glowing shapes began to form in the fog ahead. I gasped as they took the shape of hulking men with distorted faces and hollow eyes. They lurched toward the car, emitting unearthly moans. I swerved around the phantoms, breath racing. More began to stagger out of the darkness, clawing with spectral hands. It was as if the tortured souls of past victims now guarded this road, craving fresh prey. Tires screeching, I barely avoided the ghost's grasp. But escape seemed impossible. No matter how far I drove, the road stretched on endlessly ahead. Panic rose in my chest. I was trapped on this endless haunted highway that delivered all into the arms of horrors. In the rearview mirror, I noticed a vehicle approaching fast behind me. It was a battered old hearse, driven by a tall, shadowy figure in a wide-brimmed hat. The mysterious undertaker pursuing lone travelers to ferry their souls. As it drew closer, I noticed a coffin rattling around in the back, freshly filled. Was it meant for me next? I pushed the gas pedal down hard, speeding away from the sinister hearse. It kept pace, inching ever closer. Up ahead, I could make out a crumbling bridge spanning a churning black river. Passing over it might be my only escape from this nightmare road. 
I blew past the moaning ghosts and raced towards the bridge. Behind me, the hearse's headlights flared, blinding me for a moment. I swerved back on course, engine roaring as I neared the bridge. Rotting planks whizzed under my tires and I braced for the bumpy passage over the river. But instead, I emerged back into the blinding fog. Somehow the bridge had transported me back to the start of the ghost highway, trapped in an endless loop. The mysterious hearse was gone, but the groaning phantoms still surrounded the car, seeking their next victim. Panic surged through me. I was doomed to drive this haunted road eternally until finally the fog spirits claimed me. But I had to fight. Gripping the wheel with white knuckles, I turned the car around back toward the bridge. It was my only hope of escaping this nightmare realm. The ghost wails grew deafening as I raced back down the road. I would not share their fate. Up ahead, the bridge came into view once more. Flooring the gas pedal, I rocketed toward it faster than before. This time as I crossed the river, I did not slow down. I blasted over the bridge, screaming a defiant cry against the denizens of this haunted road. Blinding light enveloped me, along with the groans of a thousand lost souls. Suddenly, I was through. The fog vanished, and the smooth pavement of the main highway lay ahead, bathed in moonlight. Glancing back, there was no sign of the phantom bridge or spirits that prowled it. I had escaped the ghost highway's endless loop. Shaken, I drove on through the cold night, grateful to be back in the land of the living. But the haunted road calls still from the edge of town, beckoning the unwary into its eerie embrace. Those who listen and enter face an eternity trapped between worlds, never able to find their way back home. My eyes were already heavy, the dashboard clock flashing 2.37 a.m. as my car cruised along the near-empty Arizona highway. I had been driving from Tucson to Sedona for a long overdue solo retreat. The road was a dark ribbon flanked by towering saguaros and jagged hills. The only light coming from my headlights and the occasional star that peeked through the cloudy sky. I was reaching for my thermos of coffee when it happened. The radio, which had been playing a soft country tune, suddenly erupted into static. Annoyed, I fumbled with the dials, trying to find another station, but to no avail. And that's when I saw her, a woman in white, on the side of the road. Startled, I stepped on the brake. In the split second that it took to slow down, my rational mind kicked in. What would a woman be doing out here in the middle of nowhere, especially at this hour? My foot almost hit the gas pedal to keep going, but something made me stop. She was young, maybe in her early twenties, her white dress glowing in the dark. Her dark hair covered her face, obscuring it from view. As I pulled over, my gut tightened. This was against my better judgment. But what if she was in trouble? I rolled down the passenger side window a couple of inches. Hey, do you need help? I called out. The woman looked up, her face now visible, and what I saw made my heart skip a beat. Her eyes were completely black, no whites or irises, just a void of darkness. Can you give me a ride? Her voice was a whisper, but it echoed in my car as if she were sitting right next to me. Every fiber of my being screamed to drive off, yet I was paralyzed, trapped in her gaze. Then, from the depth of my subconscious, an old Native American proverb my grandmother used to tell me surfaced. Never lock eyes with evil, for it will consume you. Summoning every ounce of willpower, I looked away, my hand gripping the gear shift. As I prepared to accelerate, she let out a wail, 
a terrible, mournful sound that seemed to reverberate in the air long after it stopped. When I glanced back to where she stood, or where she should have been standing, she was gone, vanished. I floored the gas pedal, my car shooting forward as if jolted by my own adrenaline. The radio blinked back to life, resuming the country song where it had left off as if nothing had happened. I didn't stop until I reached Sedona, and even then I couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that had enveloped me. Later, as I recounted my experience to a local, he nodded gravely. Sounds like La Llorona, he said, referring to the weeping woman, a famous ghostly figure in Hispanic folklore. She's been seen on these roads before. You're lucky you drove away. Whether it was La Llorona or something else entirely, I can't say, but I do know that the experience forever altered my perception of what lies beyond the realm of human understanding. Now, whenever I find myself driving on lonely roads in the dead of night, I can't help but wonder what, or who, might be lurking just beyond the reach of my headlights. This happened to me a few months ago. My two friends and I decided to take a trip to Los Angeles for fun. Keep in mind that we're from the East Coast and we don't know anybody in LA. On the last day of our vacation, we had to check out of the hotel by 11 a.m. The night before, we had gotten back to the hotel really late, so we ended up sleeping in. We knew that it would be difficult to get completely packed up and ready to leave by 11, so we decided to go to the front desk and request a late checkout of noon. We had done this at another hotel before with no issues, and this place wasn't really at capacity with guests, so we figured it was a reasonable request. I drew the short straw and was tasked with going down to the front desk. The elevator in this hotel was really old and quite small, and I found it to be very creepy. I also have mild claustrophobia. So I avoided the elevator and walked down the three flights of stairs instead. I asked the receptionist if we could have a late checkout and gave her the room number. She looked at me surprised and said, yes, we approved your late checkout already a few minutes ago. I was very confused and I asked her to elaborate. Apparently, a girl had come down a minute or two before me to ask for a late checkout for our room number, and then had walked out of the building. At this point, I figured that maybe one of my friends had, for whatever reason, decided to take the elevator down and ask before I did. I grumbled a bit at this because I had just walked down those stairs for no reason at all, and it didn't make any sense why they would ask me to go and then beat me to it. But I got back to the room, and to my surprise, both of my friends were there. One of them was taking a shower, and the other one was packing. It didn't look like either of them had left the room. So, I was kind of like, alright, which one of you's the prankster? They were pretty confused and asked me to explain. So I told them what the receptionist had said, and they were shocked. Neither of them had left the room, and it seemed too big of a coincidence that somebody would have the same request as us at the same time and just make the mistake of giving our room number. I have no idea who that girl was that made the request. They started joking that maybe it was me from another dimension or something. But yeah, whatever it was, the whole thing was kind of eerie. I work as a bartender in a quaint town nestled in the suburbs of Vancouver, British Columbia. 
The establishment I work at is housed in a heritage building, standing proudly on the main street. Over a century old, it opened its doors, I believe, as a hotel in the 1920s, or perhaps even earlier. From the moment I began working there a year ago, whispers of a resident ghost circulated among the staff. My general manager and co-workers would recount their eerie experiences, unexplained events that left a chill in the air. More than once, as we settled the cash register at the end of the night, items that had no reason to fall would spontaneously tumble, startling us. Inconsequential things, like plates with sugar or salt, would suddenly take on a foreboding presence. However, one particular night stands out, an experience so strange that I still grapple with its reality. It was nearing midnight, our official closing time, and the only souls remaining were my general manager, the chef, a line cook, and a friend who awaited my shift's end. Given the peacefulness of the evening, I had wrapped up my duties early and decided to step outside for a cigarette. Adjacent to the bar is a liquor store, accessible from the back of our building. A stairway leads down to the back street, and to the right there's a door to a shared storage room, which proves handy if we ever run low on supplies during a busy evening. Only a privileged few, my general manager among them, possess a key to this room. As my cigarette neared its end, I began my ascent up the stairs. Midway, I noticed a hand from within, pulling the back door closed. The light from the room streamed out, and I presumed my general manager had ventured in, perhaps to retrieve something. However, as I entered the bar, there he was, seated as before. Puzzled, I said, I just saw someone slip into the storage room. I thought it was you, but here you are. His casual demeanor shifted in an instant. Rising briskly, we both headed to the storage area. He unlocked the door, disarmed the alarm, and scoured the room. Moments later, he returned, confirming that the room was empty. We often play pranks on each other, but the gravity of my expression assured him that this wasn't one of those times. With a mix of amusement and unease, he said, Well, it seems like you've had your introduction to our resident ghost. Welcome, I guess. Anyone who's taken a history class knows about the Old North Church in Boston's North End. Its steeple was where two lanterns were hung as a signal in 1775 indicating the British were coming by sea, leading to Paul Revere's infamous midnight ride. I lived a few blocks away and often took evening strolls around the area, relishing its historical ambiance. However, one evening's encounter turned my casual walks into something more profound. It was around midnight, the streets deserted and the church bathed in a soft moonlit glow. As I approached the church, I noticed a faint light emanating from its steeple. Curious, considering the time, I moved closer, trying to get a better view. That's when I saw them, two shadowy figures moving around the belfry, appearing to hang lanterns. Their movements were methodical, a practiced choreography rooted in purpose. Frozen in place, I watched as the figures completed their task and stood still, looking out into the distance, as if waiting for something, or someone. Moments later, the faint sound of horse hooves echoed in the silence, growing louder with each passing second. As the sound approached its zenith, a spectral figure on horseback galloped past me, his form translucent, but unmistakably that of Paul Revere. The apparition sped through the North End's winding streets before disappearing into the mist, leaving behind an odd stillness. The figures in the belfry, their duty done, slowly faded away. 
their silhouettes merging with the shadows of the church. I stood there, heart racing, realizing I had just witnessed a reenactment of one of the most pivotal moments in American history. It felt as though the past had momentarily bled into the present, a testament to the city's rich background of events that shaped the nation. After that night, my walks near the Old North Church took on a new significance. I never saw the ghostly figures again, but I often paused, gazing up at the steeple, feeling an overwhelming connection to the generations that walked these streets before, their spirits forever intertwined with Boston's bricks and cobblestones. Working as a night security guard at a museum in Pine Bluff, I believed I had one of the easiest jobs. Just meandering through silent exhibits, occasionally checking doors and watching monitors. However, one night turned the monotony into absolute terror, permanently etching itself into my memory. It was a routine shift, the museum eerily quiet, the only sounds my footsteps and the distant hum of the air conditioning. I was making my rounds, walking through a new exhibit on ancient artifacts, items belonging to a civilization renowned for their potent connection to the spiritual realm. I remember stopping to study a ceremonial mask, its features contorted into an eternal scream, supposedly used in rituals to ward off malevolent spirits. That's when I heard the first whisper. Turning around, I found nothing but the stillness of the exhibit. Chalking it up to my imagination, I continued on. However, the whispers grew, a chorus of unintelligible murmurs bouncing off the walls. Heart racing, I ventured deeper into the exhibit, where a set of ceremonial daggers were displayed. And that's when I saw it, one of the daggers, floating in midair, as if held by invisible hands. And that's when I saw it, one of the daggers, floating in midair, as if held by invisible hands. Before I could process the scene, it clattered to the floor. The whispers morphed into a cacophony of angry voices. Panic took over, and I ran towards the main hall, but stopped dead in my tracks. The artifacts were animating. Statues were turning their heads to watch me, painted eyes following my every move, and pottery shards assembling, suspended in the air, forming incomplete, hovering figures. The air grew dense, and a deep, guttural growl filled the space. It was coming from the mask I had admired earlier, except now, it wasn't just a carving. The mask was alive, the mouth moving, the sound resonating through the bones of the building. It spoke in a language I couldn't understand, but the message was clear, anger, and a warning. In sheer terror, I bolted, not looking back, my breaths ragged and heart feeling like it was about to burst. I didn't slow down until I was in the safety of the security office, slamming the door shut and locking it. Through the monitors, I watched the artifacts slowly return to their inanimate state, the shadows receding as though nothing had occurred. I quit the job immediately after that night. The museum conducted multiple investigations, checking the footage, which inexplicably showed nothing but me running in panic through empty, silent rooms. They concluded it was a stress-induced episode, but I know what I witnessed. That night at the museum in Pine Bluff tore down the rational world around me, introducing me to a realm where ancient spirits stirred to life within their treasured artifacts. The experience left me with nightmares that follow me to this day, reminding me that some things especially those tied with spiritual reverence from their past, carry with them an essence that refuses to be caged, even in death. So in 2019, 
My family and I are driving back from Narrabeen when we drove on Wakehurst Parkway. There's a legend about that road that a lady in all white is on it. And if you're not careful, she can appear inside your car. So we're driving back at around 9 p.m. and we're in the thick bush area. My mother, brother, sister, and I were asleep. My father was all alone. According to my dad, he was driving when he saw a lady all in white on the side of the road. He freaked out, but continued driving on. But then he saw the same lady two minutes later on the same side of the road. My father told us he was so freaked out that he tried to drive faster. Two minutes later, the same lady. After we got home, he told us what he had seen. And personally, I couldn't sleep for a couple of nights. The hike started like any other, a blend of sunlight and shadow, fresh air, and the freedom that only a trail could offer. My backpack settled comfortably on my shoulders as I took the familiar path leading up toward the mountain summit. Birds offered their songs as if to cheer me on. Everything was right in the world. That is, until I stumbled upon the clearing. A gnarled tree stood at its center, its limbs reaching outward like a pleading gesture. Around the trunk, tattered pieces of paper were pinned, remnants of past hikers and their ventures. As a hiker myself, I knew it was a tradition. Leave a note, take a note, sort of like an unofficial ledger of those who've come and gone. Curious, I stepped closer to inspect the scraps of paper. Some were simple messages. John was here, or Sarah and Mike made it to the top. But my eyes caught on one poster, a missing person notice, weathered by time and rain. My breath hitched as I looked closer. It was me. Dated five years into the future, the paper showed a photograph remarkably like the one on my driver's license. My name was printed in bold, stark letters, missing. Last seen hiking near Stone Mountain. Contact if you have any information. A cold sweat broke out across my back. My hands trembled as I pulled my phone out to capture a picture of the poster half expecting it to disappear like a figment of some surreal dream. But there it remained, in the frame of my screen, and in reality before me. Questions spiraled through my mind like a relentless whirlpool. Was this a prank? A cruel joke plotted by a friend or an enemy? But why? And how could they produce something so... convincing? Yet, if it was a joke, why did my gut churn with such intense unease, as though reality itself had twisted askew? I left the clearing as quickly as I could, my pace now a hurried march. The rest of the trail felt longer, the mountain air denser. The forest no longer whispered its comforting lullabies. Instead, it seemed to close in on me like an imposing maze. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, took on an ominous tone. I pushed on, propelled by a desire to put as much distance as possible between me and that eerie clearing. When I finally emerged from the trail, I felt like I'd been spat out from another world. I threw my gear into the car and sped home, where I examined the photo I'd taken. The image on the screen was as unsettling as the paper itself, a ghostly harbinger of a future I didn't understand. Days turned into weeks, and the incident transformed into an unsettling memory, buried but never forgotten. I considered showing the photo to friends, to family, even to the police. But something stopped me each time, the unsettling notion that some questions are better left unanswered. Still, the poster changed something fundamental in me. These days, when I hike, I steer clear of that specific trail opting for paths that offer fewer questions and more peace of mind. Yet sometimes, when the night is still and sleep evades me, 
I find myself pondering that mysterious poster, a harbinger of an unspoken future. Could it be a twisted rip in the fabric of time, a prank, or a warning? I may never know. And perhaps that uncertainty is the most unsettling part of it all, a mystery that trails behind me like an ever-present shadow, lurking just beyond the horizon of my understanding. The first time I heard it, my hands froze over my dinner plate, fork half raised. The sound cut through the usual evening quiet, a human scream, elongated and piercing. My heart raced. Instinct pulled me to my feet, but reason anchored me. It happened again, another scream, the sound filling the empty corners of my cabin. My neighbor had warned me, said it was the birds, but a primal part of me buzzed with alarm. I had to know. Flashlight in hand, I ventured into the dark labyrinth of trees. Moonlight filtered through the canopy, casting shifting patterns on the ground. The forest seemed to breathe, and my footsteps sounded like an invasion. Then it happened. A scream, so close I could almost feel the vibration in the air. I swung my flashlight toward the sound, half expecting to see a face twisted in anguish. Instead, a bird, a black silhouette against the dark sky, swooped from a branch and disappeared into the underbrush. More screams joined in, a cacophony that felt like an eerie choir. Birds? Mimicking human agony? My mind spun, juggling disbelief and the chilling reality. I watched as they fluttered from tree to tree, each scream indistinguishable from a human's. Yet, something was missing. No anguish, no pain. Just air funneled through feathers and beak. Eventually I returned home, but sleep eluded me. Lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, I wrestled with what I had heard, what I had seen. Nature, as it turns out, is neither kind nor malevolent. It simply is. The birds screamed not out of sorrow, but because that's what they did, a chilling phenomenon without rhyme or reason. Days turned into weeks, and I found a new routine. I still heard the birds, their nightly screams a haunting lullaby that no longer robbed me of sleep. It became a part of my life, another element in the complex mosaic of the forest. I never found out why the birds scream, and maybe that's the point. In a world teeming with questions, not all answers bring comfort. Sometimes the enigma is more tolerable than the truth. And so, I let the birds scream. They fill the night with sound, each cry an enigmatic note in the symphony of the forest. It's unsettling, yes, but it's also a reminder, a stark, unforgiving echo of life's complexities. And I listen. We were pretty beat from the long drive, but we stayed up late hanging around the fire, having some beers and grilling hot dogs. It felt good to be out here disconnected from everything. The woods were so peaceful at night. At some point, Dana said she heard music playing faintly in the distance. We all quieted down and listened. Sure enough, we could make out the indistinct sounds of people laughing and singing along to guitar music. Must be another group's campsite nearby. Let's go crash their party, Tyler said. He was pretty buzzed by then. Yeah, I want to see who else is out here, Dana added. She looked a little creeped out by the distant music and wanted company. I shrugged and figured why not. We grabbed flashlights and started hiking through the dark trees toward the sounds. I felt sticks and rocks poking into my feet through my thin sneakers. As we walked deeper into the woods, the music got louder and more raucous, like a full-on party. We shouted a few, hellos, but no one ever answered back. 
the forest just seemed to swallow up our voices. We kept on toward the sound of singing and laughing, even though the hair on my arms was standing up. I couldn't see any distant campfire light or anything. Finally, we came stumbling into a little clearing. They must be just on the other side, Tyler said excitedly. But there was nothing. The music cut off abruptly, leaving just the normal nightwood sounds. No tents, coolers, picnic tables. Nothing to indicate a campsite had been there at all. That's bizarre. I know I heard people here, Dana said in a small voice. We all felt the creep factor rising. Let's get back to our site, I urged. We turned our flashlights back toward where I thought our camp was, but after 15 minutes of walking, there was no sign of it. We were well and truly lost. The laughter was long gone. It was dead quiet now, except for branches scratching and critters scurrying. Even our own campfire light had vanished. We wandered in the dark woods for what felt like hours, getting more turned around by the minute. Exhausted and freaked out, we took shelter under a rocky overhang as the first light of dawn started glowing through the trees. I don't know what was going on in these woods, but we sure as hell couldn't wait to get out of there. This was one camping trip I won't be forgetting any time soon. This happened when I was in middle school. I'm about to graduate high school. I still remember every detail to this day. When I was younger, my mother sent my siblings and I to this cute little summer camp in the mountains. It was one week in the middle of nowhere. No cell service, no quick way to reach anybody, and we were miles and miles from the nearest town. This event happened in my third year of attendance. The way these campsites were set up goes as follows. You were split up by gender and age group. Each campsite had four cabins with five raised beds in each and one lean-to for the assigned camp counselor. So in your cabin, you've got four buddies that you get to know fairly well throughout the week. There's also no bathrooms at the campsites. So if you had to go, you would have to get the TP from your counselor and go into the woods. We were about 12 at the time, so we always had to go with a buddy. This one night, a girl in my cabin, who I had become pretty close with throughout the week, was just talking to me in the dark of our cabin about absolutely nothing. Just two kids who couldn't sleep. So we opted to stay up and talk until we could sleep. Eventually, she tells me she has to go to the bathroom and asks if I'll go with her. I say, yeah, no biggie. So we grab our flashlights and sandals and hike over to get some TP. And then we go back past our cabin. Ours was the farthest out on the edge of our campsite, a good 20 feet from the other cabins. And we go a little ways into the woods. I stand on the path while she goes up into the trees to do her business. Again, we're 12. It's cold and we're both afraid of the dark. So she asks me to keep talking to her so she doesn't freak herself out. So we're talking about nothing and I'm doing that little step dance you do when you're cold, swishing my flashlight around to see if I'd find anything cool. I almost never go to the mountains and I just wanted to know if there'd be any cool plants or animals that I could see in the distance. I stop as my light lands about 13 feet away from me. I was dead in my tracks. To this day, I don't know what else to describe this thing as other than the description of the rake from that creepypasta story. I know how childish that sounds, but it's the only comparison I had in my head. It looked freakishly lanky, extremely decrepit, pale, hairless, like a person, but definitely not a person. I could only see its head, shoulders, and from its forearms to its fingers, it stretched out as if it was crawling down the path. It had long, spindly fingers, 
that seemed to sharpen at the end. I really don't know if I was looking at nails and claws, or if its skin was just stretched like that. Its head was pointed slightly downward, and I would later figure that it was as if it was trying to avoid the light beam, but I could still see its eyes. Eyes that still make me shiver if I think about it too long. Large, black ones. I don't know if it was extremely dilated pupils, or if its eyes were just black, but it was like the eyes themselves bulged out of its head. I was too scared to shine my light any farther, and I could see one of its hands slowly creeping toward me. I was petrified in my spot. I didn't move my light off of it once I saw it. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't gonna just leave this girl out there if it actually was something that might have hurt her. I told her to hurry up. She asked me why my voice was shaking. I remember saying, I, I don't want you to freak out. It's probably nothing. I I'll tell you when we get back, but uh, w when you're done, just tell me because we're gonna make a run for the cabin, okay? That really made her move. I felt bad for scaring her, but I myself was terrified. I heard her say, done, and I just told her to run. I spun around, finally taking my light off of it, and sprinted so quickly that I caught up to her in seconds. This might have been my own heartbeat pulsing in my ears, but I was sure. I could hear it almost galloping behind me. We were both moving so quickly that we slipped a bit on the leaves in front of our cabin door. I remember two of the other girls waking up when the door slammed behind us as I fumbled with the hook that would lock it. I don't really know how I thought that would help though. It was a poor lock. My friend was freaking out, asking me what I saw and practically begging me to tell her I was pranking her. I couldn't say anything though, as I had begun to have one of the worst panic attacks in my life. My breathing became audibly labored and someone had to get up to get our camp counselor, which is what got me talking again. She got about halfway to the door before I said, no, and that was what made everyone more freaked out. Eventually, our counselor heard us and came to the cabin. Someone opened the door for her and she came in, wanting to know why I was crying so viciously and why everyone was panicked. I was able to piece together a coherent enough sentence that she got the gist. Obviously, she didn't believe me, who would, but she finally gave up on trying to convince me when she offered to go with me to confirm there was nothing there, and I just kept crying harder at the thought. I slept in the lean-to with her for the rest of the week. I'll be the first to admit that I can't honestly know what I saw. I was 12, it was dark, and I was tired, with probably an overactive imagination. But I know that staring off into the dark has never struck such terror into me like that before. I know that figure that I saw, I just don't know what to call it. I still don't really know what to make of it but I think about it every summer. The hiking trail through the forest was familiar. Each bend, each fork, leading deeper into the woods held a nostalgia for Maya and me. We'd hiked it dozens of times, our love story punctuated by the footfalls on this very path. It was a year ago on this trail that we'd lost a shoe. A ridiculous thing, really. Maya's right hiking boot had somehow gotten loose and fallen off. We looked everywhere, but we never found it. A small loss, but it became one of our go-to funny stories. So, when we came across a lone shoe sitting squarely in the middle of the path, laughter was our first reaction. Hey, look, someone else decided to donate to the forest, Maya chuckled. I bent down to get a closer look. No way. It's a right boot, 
Size 7. This is your missing shoe. She raised an eyebrow. Come on, what are the odds? It's been a year. I picked it up, brushing off the leaves and dirt. It looked almost new, its material free from rot or wear, the brand and design matching the pair she used to have. This is too weird, Maya said, taking the shoe from my hands. We looked at each other, the humor dissipating like mist before the sun. This didn't make sense. We'd lost that shoe miles away from this spot, and the condition, it should have weathered a year of forest life. Let's get going, I suggested, suddenly eager to leave this peculiar find behind us. We walked in uneasy silence. The trees seemed to loom a little taller, their shadows stretching dark fingers across the trail. Birds chatted overhead, but their songs sounded discordant, almost mocking. When we reached the spot where we'd lost the shoe a year ago, we paused. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, just a bend in the trail framed by oak and pine, sunlight filtering through in dappled patches. Look, Maya whispered, pointing to the ground. Right there, where she'd lost her boot, was a fresh footprint. A right footprint, its shape mirroring that of the lone boot we'd found. A shiver crawled up my spine. It felt like the forest itself was watching us, that our movements were echoed by something we couldn't see or understand. The eeriness clung to us, the silence broken only by our hurried steps. Finally, we reached the end of the trail, the car park a welcome sight. Without speaking, we packed our gear into the car and drove off. The forest receded in the rearview mirror, but its unsettling memory lingered. Days passed, the shoe sat in our garage, an enigma neither of us wanted to touch. Maya suggested we throw it away, but I hesitated. It was as though discarding it would be an admission of something too strange to articulate. And then, one morning, it was gone. The shoe had vanished from the garage, leaving an empty space on the shelf. Maya shrugged it off, saying maybe one of us had moved it and forgotten. I wanted to believe her. I really did. Yet the absence gnawed at me, as if the missing shoe had become a metaphor for an unanswered question a puzzle missing its final piece. Weeks later, we returned to the forest. An unspoken agreement hung between us to avoid talking about the shoe or the footprint. We just wanted a normal hike to reclaim the sanctuary this trail had once been for us. But halfway in, we found it again. A lone right boot, size seven, placed neatly in the center of the path. The same brand, the same design, impossibly new. This time, we didn't stop. We didn't discuss it. We quickened our pace until we were almost running, each step an affirmation of our desire to leave this bewildering mystery behind. As we exited the forest, a chill washed over me. I looked back one last time. The trees stood like sentinels, their branches swaying gently in the wind or perhaps in farewell. We never return to that trail, but sometimes when we're alone in the silence of our thoughts, I catch Maya looking at her hiking boots lined up neatly by the door. And I know she's wondering, as I am, whether that other shoe is still out there on the trail, waiting for the moment we dare return and wondering what might happen if we do. The gate was rusted, the fence overgrown, but the foreboding air around the old military base remained palpable. I had heard stories, of course, urban legends of secret experiments and concealed truths, but those tales didn't deter me. Armed with a camera and the boundless optimism of an explorer, I pushed through the rotting barriers. 
The base lay like a fossilized relic, caught between the past and an uncertain decay. Buildings stood emptied of life, yet filled with the ghosts of classified actions. Most doors were locked or jammed, but one yielded as if inviting me into its secrets. It was an underground bunker, a dark descent into subterranean chambers. I flicked on my flashlight, illuminating corridors lined with locked metal cabinets and old office furniture. Then something caught my eye, a file cabinet standing slightly ajar, its lock apparently defeated by time or previous intruders. Curiosity pulled me closer. The first few folders were mundane, predictable stuff, budget reports and duty rosters. But then I found it, a file marked with a symbol I had never seen, but instantly understood as being not of this world. It was as if the very sight of it instilled the symbol's meaning into my brain. Alliance. My hands shook as I leafed through the documents. What they revealed was a narrative so outrageous, yet so meticulously detailed, that disbelief turned into dread. This was no conspiracy theory. This was an actual alliance between high-ranking government officials and an alien civilization, identified only by the same strange symbol. The file outlined joint projects, exchanges of technology and information, plans for public disclosure, and contingencies for keeping it all under wraps. Dates spanned decades, and some even projected into the future. Upcoming rendezvous, expected technological handovers, even a long-term agenda for the slow integration of the two civilizations. What really seized my attention was the handwritten notes scribbled in the margins, desperate warnings from what seemed like a dissenting officer. We don't know their true objectives, one note read. We are fools playing with fire, declared another. As I flipped through the last pages, I realized the documents became increasingly recent. The most chilling entry was the last, a single sentence typed and underlined. Final phase initiation imminent. A shiver crawled up my spine. I looked around, suddenly conscious of the enclosing darkness, of how deep underground I was, of how alone I felt. The air thickened, and for the first time I considered that I might not be alone at all. Just then, a noise echoed through the bunker, a mechanical hum gradually intensifying. My flashlight flickered, then died, plunging me into oppressive darkness. I fumbled to get it back on, heart racing, but it seemed drained of power. In that darkness, I felt a presence, not human, yet undeniably sentient, surrounding and analyzing me. Curiosity is both your strength and your downfall, a voice resonated in my mind. I recognized the form of telepathic communication, a cold stream of thoughts invading my consciousness. You have discovered a truth not meant for your kind, not yet. The weight of those words left me paralyzed. I felt my thoughts being sifted, evaluated, my actions weighed for their potential ripple effects. And as quickly as it came, the presence receded fading into the depths of the hidden chambers around me. I found myself alone in the dark, the mechanical hum slowly receding, replaced by an unsettling silence. By some miracle, or perhaps an alien override, my flashlight flickered back to life. I left the file where I found it, hastily exiting the bunker, and I fled the military base my every step shadowed by an eerie sense of being watched. Days turned to weeks, and no one came looking for me. Life resumed its old rhythm, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being a marked man, of knowing too much, yet understanding too little. Recently, I've noticed them, people who don't quite fit in, whose gaze lingers a little bit too long, who vanish when I look again. They're always there, on the periphery of my life, 
never intervening but always observing. And each night as I try to sleep, the last thought that crosses my mind is that single haunting sentence, final phase initiation imminent. I still don't know what it means or when it will happen, but the unsettling realization lingers. I am now a small involuntary part of this looming final phase, whatever it is. And so I wait, wondering when the true cost of my curiosity will reveal itself. My telescope was my sanctuary, a way to escape the mundane things of the terrestrial and gaze into the celestial realm. A clear night, no clouds to obstruct the sky's panorama of stars. Comfortably seated in my backyard, I peered through the lens, losing myself in the choreography of constellations and planets. But that night, something interrupted the familiar tableau. My eyes widened as I caught sight of it, a collection of lights unlike any aircraft or satellite. I adjusted the telescope's focus, my breath caught between fascination and a prickling sense of unease. They were there, a fleet of unidentified flying objects, UFOs, shimmering orbs of light moving in patterns too purposeful to be random, a celestial dance of sorts complex maneuvers executed with a precision that defied explanation. My heart drummed a rapid beat in my chest. This was unprecedented, something even the most avid sky watchers could only dream of witnessing. And yet, the reality of it left me filled with an eerie discomfort. They didn't just hover, they moved in intricate spirals, forming shapes and splitting apart only to reconfigure moments later as if performing, but for whom? My eyes stayed glued to the telescope, my hand reaching involuntarily to adjust the lens for a closer look. As I zoomed in, one of the objects broke away from the formation and seemed to pause, as if becoming aware of my scrutiny. A chill ran through me, a shiver that told me this was no ordinary observation. My fingers tightened around the telescope's frame, knuckles white. The rogue object pulsated, its light intensifying as it moved in a path that felt dangerously purposeful. My heart sank as I realized it was coming toward Earth, toward me. An unshakable sense of dread gripped me. I was no longer a passive observer, but somehow involved in this cosmic ballet. I stepped back, leaving the telescope pointed skyward, its lens capturing the last vestiges of a scene I could no longer bear to watch. I turned to go inside, my steps quickening as I moved away from the uncertainty above. But just as I reached the door, a brilliant flash lit up the yard, so bright it cast stark shadows against the walls. I froze, my body refusing to move as I sensed more than saw a presence descend into my backyard. Summoning courage, I turned around. The object had landed, or perhaps materialized, its form an opaque sphere hovering inches above the ground. Its surface was a translucent membrane, pulsating like a living organism, emitting a strange glow. And then it spoke, not in words, but in thoughts a telepathic resonance that filled the air and penetrated my consciousness. Observer observed, roles reversed, change initiated. The message, or warning, disappeared as quickly as it arrived, leaving a void filled only by the night's ambient sounds. The object's light dimmed, and with a sudden acceleration that defied physics, it shot up into the sky rejoining the celestial formation as if it had never left. I stood there, my body numb, my mind a storm of unanswered questions and unvoiced fears. 
the sky returned to its familiar state, a vast expanse punctuated by stars and planets, as if the night's extraordinary events had simply never transpired at all. But something had changed, both out there and within me. The dread lingered, a dark cloud overshadowing the awe. The message, its implications unfathomable, remained in my thoughts. Change initiated. I've returned to the telescope night after night, scanning the skies for another glimpse of the unexplained. But the celestial dance has vanished, leaving only the regular occupants of the night sky. Still, a sense of anticipation haunts me, a foreboding that I can't shake. The message reverberates in my subconscious as I search the stars, a cosmic echo that hints at a future yet to unfold. What change has been initiated, and what role do I have to play in this unfathomable script? I gaze upwards and for the first time find no comfort in the stars. Instead, each twinkling point of light feels like a watching eye, and I can't help but wonder if somewhere out there they are still observing, still dancing, still preparing for whatever change is yet to come. I was home alone, sitting on the couch watching TV when I heard the front door suddenly click and lock on its own. Startled, I immediately got up to investigate. When I tried the doorknob, it was firmly locked, even though I knew I hadn't touched it. I distinctly remembered leaving it unlocked when I had let the dog out earlier. My pulse quickened as I considered the possibilities. Had the wind blown it shut? Was there an intruder in the house who had locked it for some reason? I cautiously checked each room, but found nothing amiss. Just to be safe, I also checked the windows to see if any were unlocked, but everything seemed secure. Returning to the front door, I examined the lock closely. There were no signs of tampering or a draft that could have blown it closed. The deadbolt required a key from both sides, so there was no way it could have locked itself accidentally. I tried the spare key, and sure enough, the door unlocked. Uneasy and perplexed, I double-checked that every window and door was locked before retreating back inside. I couldn't figure out how that front door had mysteriously locked itself while I was sitting just a room away. It was an unnerving experience, making me feel like I wasn't alone or I was being watched. I still have no rational explanation for how it happened. All I know is that the seemingly self-locking door rattled my nerves and made me look over my shoulder for weeks after. I tried to shake off the uneasy feeling, but I couldn't get the incident out of my mind. The rest of the night, I found myself double-checking the front door lock every time I walked by. I also couldn't stop thinking about the layout of the house and where someone could potentially hide or access a locked door. I kept peering around corners and listening for any unusual sounds. Later, as I was getting ready for bed, I thought I heard footsteps upstairs. I froze, straining to hear where they were coming from. Gripping a baseball bat, I slowly made my way upstairs, only to find nothing there. My imagination was simply getting the best of me, still spooked from the mystery of the locked door. Exhausted, but still vigilant, I corralled the dog into my bedroom and locked the door. I tucked the bat under my bed within arm's reach, should I need to defend myself in the night. As I lay there in the dark, I kept replaying the sound of the front door locking in my mind. How could it have locked itself so seamlessly without any drafts or interference? The spare key proved it had been the actual deadbolt mechanism turning, not just the latch. Sometimes in the middle of the night, I suddenly jolted awake, 
I thought I heard the upstairs floorboards creaking, as if somebody was walking around. The dog was also sitting up in alert. My heart pounded as I lay frozen, listening intently. After what felt like an eternity, the creaking stopped. Exhaustion finally overtook me again, and I fell into a troubled sleep. The next morning, I checked the entire house once more, but nothing was disturbed. I even had my brother come take a look at the front door to see if it had malfunctioned, but he insisted that all the hardware was working normally. But I still can't shake the ominous feeling that came over me that night. Something strange happened that I still can't explain, and I feel like I'm still being watched in my own home. I now know locks and bats provide only an illusion of safety against the unexplainable. When I bought my first house, a cute little craftsman bungalow, I was thrilled to finally have a place of my own. I embraced home projects and decorating with gusto, excitedly making the place my own. That made it all the more violating when the bizarre incident started. It began with creaking floors and banging pipes, normal sounds for an old house, but soon it progressed to loud thuds and crashes that seemed to originate within the walls. I'd be reading in bed and a deafening bang would make me leap up in fright. I'd rush to check every room only to find nothing disturbed or out of place. Friends brushed it off as just the house settling, but I knew this was more than shifting boards or expanding pipes. There was a rhythm and intent to the sounds, like heavy furniture being slammed about or doors being violently flung open and shut, but always invisible. No broken lamps or open cupboards betrayed the source. The banging and crashing wasn't the only strange occurrence either. Lights would flick off and on by themselves, even with brand new bulbs. I'd come home to find cabinets wide open that I knew I'd closed. One night, I woke to see my bedroom door slowly creaking open, as if someone was entering the room, but no one was there. The final straw was a terrifying night I huddled in my room, listening to what sounded like a violent struggle unfolding within the walls. Thudding, crashing, strange muffled grunts and groans. It went on for hours, moving from room to room before finally fading. I barely slept that night, shaken by the invasion of my space. The next day I called my realtor in tears, demanding to know if anyone had died on the property. She dodged the question at first, making vague allusions to an event before the previous owner's time. She finally confessed that a woman was killed there by her boyfriend in the 80s. He killed her in the bedroom and hid her body in the walls. I moved out that week, leaving the invisible intruder to its unrest. Though I miss that charming bungalow, some spaces hold energies we can't see, but profoundly feel. The evil that happened there stained its very bones, releasing ghosts of violence I couldn't cleanse or sage away. Wherever I land next, I'll be sure no dark shadows haunt its past. Looking back, I now see how naive I was not to ask more questions before buying a house with such a traumatic history but the realtor seemed far too eager for a sale to disclose the chilling details up front. I've since learned to trust my intuition. If a space feels wrong, there's a reason. Our bodies perceive what our minds try to logically explain away. But as I learned, some evils defy logic, lingering long after their perpetrators are gone. That craftsman still stands, housing who knows what lost souls within its walls. I wish its future owners the peace I was unable to find there, but its pain is not mine to reconcile. I listen now when a space tells me to leave.
The house was fine. Really, it was. A few creaky floors, a leaky faucet, nothing I couldn't handle. But then the smells started. These weren't your average old house smells. No, these were strong, distinct, and they would appear out of nowhere. First, it was the smell of roses, strong and sweet, like someone had just walked through the room carrying a fresh bouquet. I walked around sniffing the air like a bloodhound, but there were no flowers, no air fresheners, nothing that could explain it. The smell lingered for about a minute and then vanished as suddenly as it came. Next, it was cigarette smoke. I don't smoke, never have, and neither did anyone who had visited recently. But there it was, the unmistakable scent of a freshly lit cigarette filling the room checked all the windows, the vents, even went outside to see if somebody was smoking nearby. Nothing. But the one that got me, the one that really sent shivers down my spine, was the smell of burnt toast. It hit me early one morning, so strong it actually woke me up. My first thought was fire, so I jumped out of bed and ran to the kitchen. The toaster was unplugged, the oven was off, and the smoke alarm was silent, and yet the smell was everywhere. That's when I started to think, what if it's not just a smell? What if it's a message? It sounds crazy, I know, but it felt like each scent was tied to a memory or moment. Roses reminded me of my grandma. She loved her rose garden. The cigarette smoke took me back to college days, hanging out with friends who smoked. And burnt toast? Well, that was the smell of Sunday mornings growing up, when my dad would attempt to make breakfast. So I started talking, not to anyone in particular, just to the air. When the rose smell came, I would say, hi grandma, thinking of you too. When cigarette smoke filled the room, I would reminisce about old friends. And burnt toast? I would tell my dad that wherever he was, I missed his attempts at cooking. The smells haven't stopped, but they've changed. They're softer now, more like whispers than shouts. I don't know if I'm actually communicating with something or someone, or if it's all in my head, but I've come to see these mysterious smells as a sort of link, a bridge between the past and the present, between this world and maybe another. And honestly, that doesn't smell bad at all. When I was approximately 12, our residence was a remote cabin located down an extended gravel road in the countryside. Our home was a mile from the nearest neighbor, providing us with total isolation. My stepfather and I, united by a shared interest in the paranormal, often embarked on explorations together. Our shared fascination with the supernatural formed a strong bond between us. In our house, bedrooms were fitted with rotating dial lights, which could be adjusted from off to dim and then to bright. Strangely, every night, the dial would seem to twist of its own volition. Moreover, the stereo in my room would occasionally turn on by itself, with the volume fluctuating unpredictably. My parents would often hear what they presumed to be my voice in the dead of night, they reported instances of a figure resembling me roaming the hallways, standing in their bedroom, and even sitting at the edge of their bed. However, each time my stepfather would sit up and call out my name, the apparition would vanish. On investigating, they would always find me sound asleep in my bed. Once, my mother even experienced being dragged to the foot of the bed during the night, my stepfather mentioned that whenever he passed by my room, he could hear hushed voices emanating from it, even when I was alone and fast asleep. One peculiar incident involved my stepfather getting ready for work, brushing his teeth in the bathroom. Out of the corner of his eye, 
he spotted what he described as an elderly Native American shaman. He claimed they even shared eye contact, yet the figure continued walking and gradually faded into nothingness. In Sydney, there's this National Park Drive where people complete runs which consist of trying to complete the drives within a timestamp. I've been doing these so-called Nasho runs for a while now with my best friend. Nothing has ever happened before, and the drive through the park is spooky at night, sure, but I've always found comfort in the woodlands or in night drives, so I never really thought anything of it. A few nights ago, Three of my friends and I went for a Nasho run, and exactly at the halfway point, we hit a pothole pretty hard, which resulted in a flat tire, so we pulled over to the side on a long road. This place has no reception, and it's in the middle of nowhere, with no way of walking through or back. We had a spare tire, but no change kit, so I had one friend on call for help which was a pain due to the lack of reception. My best friend panics a lot, so she was on the verge of crying, and I was rummaging through the boot for a wrench and a jack. About 20 meters away was a parked car, which was strange because the last house we passed was about a kilometer away, but we just shrugged it off. Later on in the dead of night, we hear a group of friends laughing, and this spooked my friends so they stayed in the car. I told them I was going to follow the laughter and ask if they had a change kit in their parked car. Nate insisted on coming with me. We walked 20 meters to the parked car and nobody was in there. It gets pretty freaking dark, so I tell him to turn on his flashlight, which he does. We turn a corner on a gravel road and once we do, we see a woman standing there with her back toward us. The group laughter had stopped which left us in the dead of night, in complete silence, in the middle of nowhere, with this random woman who was just standing there. But she looked pretty normal to me, so I approached her slowly. I said, hey. She didn't turn around or react at all. So I stopped in my tracks, but Nate continued walking toward her. He stopped about five meters away behind her. I yelled out, oi. And again, she didn't turn around. We weren't able to see her face, but something just wasn't right. She was tall, in all white. But I looked at Nate and he just stood there. And under his breath, he muttered my name and told me to go repeatedly. So I turned around and started walking back. By the time we passed the car, we started running back to our car. We sat inside and I asked what happened and he said that something was wrong because a woman just shouldn't be standing there by herself in pitch darkness in the middle of a gravel road. In addition to that, she didn't react to us or our source of light. He said he just felt ominous about it all. We told our other two friends and Nate was very shaken up. They sort of laughed it off. And when we ended up finally changing the tire, we turned the car back around and stopped right where we had seen the woman. I rolled the window down and shined my flashlight on the gravel road. The woman was gone though. No more laughter, just silence. I thought maybe I had imagined her, but we stood right there and Nate was right behind her. However, every single one of us heard the group laughter and there's a fair share of paranormal stories about this area but up until then, I'd never really paid attention to it. I know it doesn't sound like much, but at the time, it was so crazy. Something just felt so, so wrong. And the way the laughter got relatively loud the closer we got, but then came to a total halt once we saw her, something was just wrong.
Even though this happened a long time ago, my memory of this event is very crisp. I remember it extremely vividly, just because of how odd and traumatic it was. A couple of years ago, my family, which consisted of my dad, my mom, my little brother, my uncle and aunt, and their two children, as well as my other uncle and his wife, were at church on a Sunday afternoon. It was just a regular Sunday mass, not anything special. What I remember happening was that all of a sudden we left in the middle of the service. We were walking out and going to the parking lot, and I remember that my aunt was hysterical. She was crying and hugging my dad. My dad was almost in tears as well. I was around seven at the time, so I was really just puzzled and confused. But eventually I forgot about it and went on with my day. Years pass and the topic comes up at a family gathering. What really happened that day still creeps me out. And how my family just talks about it now, as if it wasn't such a weird thing to have experienced, is totally beyond me. Anyway, on that Sunday, my family was leaning on one of the walls of the building, facing the priest who was giving a lecture. It was really busy that day, and there weren't any seats left. About 30 minutes into Mass, my aunt notices a guy who looks almost identical to my deceased uncle in the crowd. She is stunned, and elbows my dad to show him what she's looking at. The man she was pointing at was fortunate enough to have gotten a seat, and he was in one of the rows on a bench, just sitting there. As my dad is staring at this guy, he's puzzled and in complete shock. The guy looks up at my dad, makes eye contact, and smiles. And then he just looks back at the priest who's giving the lecture. My dad freaks out, and so does my aunt, who noticed that the guy was an exact copy of my deceased uncle. The guy all of a sudden gets up, excuses himself from the people that he has to cross in front of in order to get out, and walks out an exit. As soon as he does, my other uncle walks on after him in an attempt to catch up and apologize for creeping him out. My uncle claims he followed him up to the exit where he turned a corner and completely lost him out of sight. Now, that's already weird, but my uncle also claims that he noticed a scar on the man's left forearm that he knew for a fact my deceased uncle had. It happened in a firework accident when he was little. Ever since then, they never saw the guy again. Some family members of ours have claimed that they've seen somebody who looks exactly like my dead uncle, but who knows if it's the same guy they saw that day. Maybe it was just some random dude, or maybe it was my uncle's last attempt at saying goodbye to his siblings. Who really knows? Either way, it's a story I'll never forget. As a child, like many others, I was accompanied by an array of imaginary friends. Among these figments of my young imagination, the one I remember distinctly was a little girl named Sophie. Sophie, approximately my age at the time, between four and six, was just an ordinary girl wearing a dress and socks. The peculiar thing about her was the noticeable crook in her neck. I grew up in an old house, possibly around 80 years old, with our next door neighbor who we affectionately referred to as Grandma and who has lived there for 60 years. This fact bears significance to the story. Sophie was my closest friend during my early years, a phenomenon not uncommon among children. We spent a lot of time talking and playing in my room, but she never ventured downstairs, claiming fear. It was a usual occurrence for me to descend the staircase, turn back and reassure her. Hey, see, it's okay. You can come down. Regardless, she would stay put, a fact I found utterly perplexing. As I aged, my interactions with Sophie dwindled, and ultimately, she faded from my memory. That was until, after relocating, my mother and I paid a visit to Grandma and began reminiscing about my childhood spent in the old house. 
My mother mentioned my habit of addressing the staircase when I was young, which piqued grandma's curiosity, prompting her to ask, who were you speaking to? I casually answered, oh, Sophie, and I started to describe her. Grandma fell into a silent contemplation. After a while, she said, you know, when I initially moved into this house, my neighbors were preparing to move out. Tragically, a month before their departure, their daughter slipped and fell down the staircase, succumbing to her injuries. She had broken her neck. You know, I do believe her name was Sophie. One day, I was walking by my nephew's bedroom. I thought I heard a noise, so I got a little bit closer, just to listen in and make sure everything was okay. I heard him whispering, so I stopped and opened the door a bit. I said, who are you whispering to? He said, no one. Just as I started to walk away, I heard him whisper again, but this time, I heard what he was saying loud and clear. He said, shh, she's gonna hear you. Totally creeped me out. The pale morning sun filtered through the tall pines as I laced up my hiking boots and prepared for a day on the trails. I had backpacked deep into the Cascades to get away from the noise and stress of everyday life. Out here, I could be fully immersed in nature. Slipping on my pack, I consulted my map and set off down the trail. I hiked for several miles, the only sounds being the wind rustling leaves, and my boots crunching on the forest floor. At a clearing, I stopped to sip some water and take in the view. Snow-capped peaks jutted up in the distance. All was tranquil. After stowing my water bottle, I stood and stretched my legs. Just then, a loud crack reverberated through the trees ahead. I froze. Another crack boomed accompanied by heavy bipedal footsteps. Adrenaline coursed through my veins. Gripping my walking stick, I called out nervously, Hello? The footsteps grew louder, branches snapping like gunshots. This was no bear or deer. It sounded like a person. But how? I was miles from civilization. Fear and fascination dueled within me. I wanted to flee, but my legs were paralyzed. The footsteps thudded closer, and suddenly, a massive creature stepped out from the pines. My heart nearly stopped. Standing before me was a huge, hair-covered beast, walking upright on two legs. It stood at least eight feet tall, with broad shoulders and muscular limbs. The face was obscured by a mane of reddish-brown hair, except for two dark, intelligent eyes gazing back at me. We stared at each other, neither of us moving a muscle. My mind reeled, unable to accept what I was seeing. Bigfoot. It couldn't be real, and yet here it was, the biggest discovery in natural history living and breathing. Slowly, Bigfoot leaned forward, eyes piercing into me with uncanny awareness. It was analyzing me as I tried fruitlessly to analyze it. I was in awe, overwhelmed by this mythical beast made real. Then, calmly, it turned and sauntered back into the ancient forest. I watched, dumbstruck, until it disappeared like a ghost. I hurried down the trail, hands shaking. 
I knew my claims would be ridiculed and dismissed, but I didn't need validation. My reality had been irrevocably shifted. I had witnessed something beyond explanation, a glimpse into the unknown. Somewhere out there, Bigfoot still dwells, a humbling reminder that nature still holds secrets beyond our grasp. I will forever cherish the brief wonder of our encounter. This is something that happened a while ago at a cabin that my family and I were renting. My sister and I were sitting outside on the back porch around 11 p.m., maybe getting closer to midnight. We were talking when we heard a noise. To me, it sounded like someone was clapping their hands, kind of like in The Conjuring, at least that's what it reminded me of. No one was outside, and the neighbors were pretty far down the road, so if it was someone, they would have had to walk all the way to the house and be standing pretty much right outside of it. The rest of my family were talking inside the kitchen. We could have heard them, and it would have been obvious if they were the ones clapping. It happened three times in three different locations, once right next to the house, once in front of us, which would have been in the back in the woods, and the third time came from the front of the house. I really don't know how to explain it, but it was pretty creepy. When I was a kid, I lived in Alabama, way out in the country. My best friend at the time lived about a mile away and my older brother and I would go over there daily during the summer. Near his property is a dead forest. All the trees are there, but they never have any leaves. It's pretty darn creepy to begin with. Sometimes we played in there, but we never went very far. One day, my brother and my friend, let's call him Sam, wandered off while I was messing with a turtle, and they disappeared. Once I was done playing with the turtle, not hurting it or anything, I went around the property looking for them, until I thought I saw one of them head into the woods. By this time, it was late afternoon and getting darker. I ran to the woods, but I couldn't see them. Then I heard what sounded like them talking, deeper in. I followed the voices, and they kept seeming farther and farther away, as though I should have been getting closer. And then, they stopped. And suddenly, I felt really scared. At that moment, I realized that the sun had already set, and it was starting to get very dark. So I ran all the way back to Sam's house. My older brother and Sam were playing Nintendo in his room, and thought that I was still in the backyard playing with the turtle. I never did figure out what I was chasing in those creepy woods. But I'm kind of glad that I never did. I'm a bus driver for TransLink, Bus 169. It goes through the Riverview Hospital complex in Coquitlam, BC. It's an abandoned mental asylum and hospital complex, with most of its buildings run down, and just a couple still in operation. It's actually the site of a lot of filming, due to how eerie some of the buildings look. I was on my last shift of the night. Always on edge, of course, because it's super eerie late at night there. Luckily, I had a couple at the back of the bus, so I wasn't exactly alone while driving through this place. As I was driving through, I saw a man sitting at the bus stop. Immediately, I was filled with dread because it was after midnight 
and I doubted that somebody would randomly be waiting for a bus at this hour, especially since this complex was closed off to the public at 9 p.m. every day. So I had to do what I had to do, and I pulled over to let the man in. But the strange thing is, when I opened the door, there was no one there on the seat, and I was pretty sure I saw a person. So I just closed the door and gunned it. I was not going outside to check. That would be a rookie mistake. Anyway, I make it the rest of the route okay, and I pull up to the last stop at the bus loop. I disengaged the locking mechanism for the back door for the couple to get out. Then I heard a guy at the back say, what the, and I turned around and I saw the back door was open, but the couple was still making their way toward the door. Our buses are equipped with a pressure sensitive push bar that activates the door to open when pushed against it. I had disengaged the lock to allow the doors to be pushed open. I asked the couple what the problem was, but I already knew what it was before they said it. The door had opened by itself. I don't know if it was just a malfunction or what, and maybe it was a coincidence that it was the same night that I stopped the bus for a man who wasn't there. But maybe we had a ghost passenger that night. I'm not sure what to do about driving that route. I really don't want to anymore. I figured I would share my experience living in a 200-year-old cabin that was definitely haunted. So all of these things happened over a span of three years. It started in 2012. A childhood friend from years back asked me if I would be her roommate. I needed to get out of my parents and she needed a roommate, so it seemed like a good situation. Nestled in a suburban area was this cabin. It dates back to sometime in the 1700s. The road the cabin is off of bears the same name as the original family that owned the house. They owned a large portion of the land that's now one of the largest cities in the US. Search American Colonial Cabin and you'll see a bunch of images that look just like it. We originally think that it was used as slave quarters, as this was tobacco country, and then later found out that it was a stable house later on. The stable house theory definitely checks out, as our dog dug up a horseshoe once. I still have it. The night we moved in, I knew the place had something eerie about it. There were no doors to the upstairs room, my room, and no doors to the downstairs bedroom. Her bedroom was an addition that somebody had added in the 80s. The previous owners also added a much needed kitchen and bathroom, as the original layout didn't have either. Now that you have a decent imagery of what I was working with, I'll start the story. So when moving in, I immediately felt a feeling of being watched. The house always felt dark, cold, and damp, much like a cellar. Par for the course with that type of house, but there was something else. It started with scratching. Every night that I would be in bed, I would wake up to this scratching directly underneath my bed by my head. At first I thought it was mice, but when I listened to it long enough, I realized that the scratching was long and drawn out, like a foot long pull, then repeated. I just covered my head, muffled my ears, and closed my eyes. I was a 23-year-old man that felt like I was cowering, but I wasn't about to tussle with wood-scratching spirits. Well, one night, I heard the scratching start. Normally, I would have been asleep at this time, but I was up late, and that's when I heard it. It started on the ceiling on the far side of my room, and then it went down the wall and then it scratched its way to directly underneath me. After a while, the scratching went across the room and back to the wall, 
and then gone. Here's why it's not mice. My walls were solid wood, as the inside logs were the same as the outside. Like I said, it was an old log cabin. There were no spaces anywhere for something to crawl, like when you have insulation and stuff like that. I got scared and I started sleeping downstairs. My roommate, now my wife, asked what was up and I told her. She said the same stuff was going on when she was home alone. This was all in the first week, by the way. Here's the creepiest part. When we moved in, I had to unscrew all of the screws that the previous renter had put into the windows. I had to unscrew one of the exterior doors that he had screwed shut. We had to clean out weird rabbit food, we think, from the oven. We had to write doesn't live here on the hundreds of mail order catalogs that the previous renter received. We always joked that the guy was a shut-in Satanist, but now I'm not sure if we're too far off. We both started sleeping downstairs in the living room and felt comfortable in numbers. The eerie feeling was easier to deal with when somebody was with you. Until one night. I had a dream that a dark force was approaching me. It was in third person, as if I was watching myself sleep. The entity started to loom over my head, and all the while I felt a pressure building up in my head and a high pitch ringing in my ears. It got so intense that I sprang up from my sleep and I looked around the room. About a second later, the TV shut off. Just cut off. We'd been having problems with the TV randomly turning on and off, but this time it was far too coincidental to be brushed off like everything else. Also, I knew I went to bed with the TV turned off. I had turned it off myself. So why was it on in the first place? We started sleeping in her room after that night. She told me that nothing really happened in there. Maybe because it was an addition, I don't know. Well, our ghost played matchmaker, and now we're trying for a kid after being married for five years, so that part worked out, I guess. Anyway, once I was upstairs reading, and as I was falling asleep, my window started to open and shut. I was already at my wit's end with the spirit, so the next day I set up the same situation. Same thing. Funny that it never does that when I'm not in there. I ended up yelling at it, telling it to leave us alone and that I was tired of it. And holy smokes, it worked. Kind of, for a while. Then when I was home alone, alarm clocks started going off. As soon as my wife would leave, drawers would open, there would be banging on the front door, and these alarm clocks would go off. Over time, it just stopped, slowed down, and ultimately fizzled into nothing. I guess as I matured there, it stopped messing with me. Who knows? Today, my in-laws live there. They were my landlords. And the home is cute, homey, and warm. I spend time there alone, and I don't feel any malice. Weird experience. I would do it all over again if I had to, though. Can't argue with results. This happened a few years ago. I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends. I don't remember all the specifics of why they went out, but that's not really important. My point is I was all alone in our cabin playing some games on my phone while listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that suddenly I got really cold, so I went to go get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow from my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much about it at the time because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me because I really don't like being home alone in general and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. 
I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had forgotten all about the strange shadow. Until I saw it again. But this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I was a little creeped out about it now since I was the only one in the cabin. I decided to lock the door to my room just in case. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot, so I asked out loud, What's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, Yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt, shorts, and my dad's slippers. It was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still and I got the feeling that it was staring at me, even though I couldn't make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I honestly don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I do remember though, is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to go back into that one. Ever since that day, I have refused to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling I got that day at the cabin can only be described as unwanted, like someone or something wanted to harm me, was trying to lure me. I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing even today. It haunts my dreams and I'm in no rush to see it again. So let me start by saying that my brother and I are extremely experienced desert campers and we have lived near deserts pretty much our whole lives. I have never in my 20 years of life ever for one second believed in anything paranormal or anything to do with evil spirits. Unlike my brother who has always sensed presences and been able to see mostly what we call jinn, also known as demons. Last night though, Things changed for me, and it marks the last time that we'll be camping alone in the desert. We've always had the same place we like to go whenever we want to camp with minimal effort. Our day started as normal as ever, but as we got closer and closer to our destination, I saw my brother's mood completely shift. When I asked what was wrong, he just shrugged me off and told me to just keep driving. When we arrived, I felt completely fine, but my brother was still unusually quiet. It was around 1 p.m. at that point, and we were planning on leaving at about 12 to 1 in the morning. Because of the heat, we made the terrible decision to set up under a few trees and a source of water, which in the Middle Eastern culture where we live is where the jinns live at night. Not that I believed in that at the time, of course. However, we still set up our camp and continued on as normal. Now, my brother always says that when he feels a presence, or several in this case, he gets extremely unlucky. First, he almost dropped a box of coals on his foot. Then he spilled an entire bottle of Coke on his phone. Then he dropped it into the sand and proceeded to smash his elbow on the edge of the chair he was sitting on. His elbow is now very swollen. And last, but certainly not least, when he was looking through one of our boxes, he felt something cold 
and sharp right against his arm. He realized it was an unsheathed knife, which we packed with its case the previous night before, and later he said that it felt like something had pushed his hand into it, right where his veins are. All of these events consecutively occurred within a matter of a few hours, which made us both uneasy, and I, for the life of me, could not figure out why he was suddenly so unlucky. As I was starting to question his clumsiness, a random couple appeared out of nowhere, informing us that they were stuck in the sand and needed help. We drive a land cruiser and they had a Nissan Altima, so we didn't expect to encounter as many issues as we did. We first dug them out without any issues, but as we pushed them out of the sand, it got stuck again. If you know anything about dune bashing or desert camping, then you understand the physics behind how wheels get stuck in sand, and the way this Nissan was stuck was incredibly unusual. It was literally stuck somewhere with plenty of space available for grip, and later my brother said that as we were digging them out of the sand, that's when he really started to feel like an evil presence was around us. But he didn't want to say anything and ruin the trip and freak me out. We ended up having to tow them out of the sand, which again was much harder than it should have been. First, our tow strap broke off of their bumper. The tow strap cost $200 and was fine, but their bumper was slightly damaged. Then we almost got stuck ourselves in a 20 minute job that took more like 90 which again was extremely unusual, and with hindsight just the beginning of all the crap to come. When we came back to our camp, we noticed how everything around us had gotten unusually quiet. The area we were in has hundreds of birds around, and as far as we have seen, three cats who sometimes pay us a visit. But there wasn't a single noise at all, other than our fire, which was dying out unusually quickly. It had gotten dark so fast that we had to scramble to build a fire to cook our dinner, before we were asked to help the couple, and I had noticed the silence, but it didn't bother me. My brother suddenly grabbed my hand as we were sitting down to eat, and said with clear fear in his voice that we should get going as quickly as possible, that he didn't feel safe. To ease both of our minds, we prayed. We are both Christian, so... Of course, we thought it would help, but I think it accelerated everything that happened and just made whatever was there angry. We quickly finished our dinner, and me being the skeptic, I was completely fine staying there, but I wanted to humor my brother. But that's when I started getting the nagging feeling that it was time to pack up and leave. It hit me like a wave, and I was quite taken aback by the feeling, so I voiced it to my brother and he agreed that we should pack up right away and leave. We started packing up at a normal pace, like we were just tired and wanted to go. And that's when we heard a sound very close to us, on the opposite side of the pond, which wasn't that big, that I could only describe as the sound of death itself. It seemed to go on for several minutes, and when I say that we looked at each other in absolute fear, I genuinely mean it. I was about to have a heart attack right then and there. At that point, after being frozen for a few minutes, and quite reasonably so, after hearing that bellowing screech so close to us, we turned on the car, drove it back so we could see better with the headlamps, and just started throwing everything into the car without much care, but with a whole lot of urgency. After the screaming, everything hit the fan. First, it was the sound of twigs snapping and footsteps all around us. Then it was the shadows behind the trees. I tried everything to get those shadows to change shape, walking around the trees and moving lights, but nothing. It looked like there were people just staring at us the whole time. You could really feel it too. We genuinely felt like we were not alone and that we weren't with friendly entities either. We also noticed that all three cats were huddled right behind our car, away from the trees, so they were not the ones snapping the twigs. At that moment, I was really hoping they were going to move so I could get us out of there safely, 
And thankfully, when we slowly started to reverse, they took a hint. But they looked absolutely terrified, and were just staring at the trees, too. It felt like whatever was there was getting closer. I've never felt anything like it. It was a gut feeling. It was just one of those natural instincts you can't ignore. Thankfully, we were able to pack up quickly. Our tent was very close to the trees, though, so that was a nerve-wracking experience. And while we were packing, it was still very silent. It's very normal for the birds around that area to continue making sounds until 2 or 3 in the morning. And at this point, it was about 8 p.m., so highly unusual. I personally think I was most terrified as I was driving back onto the main dirt path to leave the desert. I know cars very well. I know how they drive in the sand. And I know our car especially well because we've had it for so long. I could instantly tell that the steering was off and completely fighting against me. This fixed itself the second we were on the highway. The sounds of twigs snapping was still all around us and it was loud enough to be heard over the sound of the car. On the path was what seemed like every bird in the area, just standing there and staring at us until we got close enough to force them to walk not even fly away. At one point, my brother just grabbed my shoulder and told me very sternly to just keep looking in front of me and under no circumstances to look through his window. It was the tone of voice that told me to listen to him for the love of God. We were in a part of the desert where we had to pretty much drive through the whole of the accessible areas to get onto the highway again, and there wasn't a single person around us. The only thing we saw was a very clearly abandoned Toyota, positioned behind a small dune and hidden by the trees, but was far enough from our campsite to easily rule out as the source of the original screech. The worst thing I saw as we were closing to the exit was that we saw in the middle of the path, staring directly at us, a deer. A deer. I have only seen one deer in 16 years of living here, and that was in someone's garden as a pet. It's safe to say that I was in complete shock. The deer was just not moving at all until I got close enough that we could practically smell the thing before it slowly walked off the path while looking right at us. We quickly moved past the deer and again my brother, with a grasp of my shoulder and a stern voice, said to keep my eyes right on the road. I asked him later as we got onto the highway what it was that he kept seeing, and he very reluctantly told me that he kept seeing large figures around us any time we went through a bend, and they were all either pointing right at us or ahead of us. I'm glad he didn't tell me at the time because I probably would have crapped myself. We still hadn't encountered anyone but we still very clearly heard sounds all around us. And again, not the usual bird or cat, but big, unrelenting sounds. When I saw the exit, I was as happy as I have ever been. But that quickly faded when once again, we saw another deer standing right in the middle of the road, slowly walking away and looking right at us. But this time, it didn't really look like a deer. It was more like a kangaroo mixed with a deer, and its eyes were milky. It looked rotten and horrible. I didn't much care, I just stepped on the gas, and fortunately it got out of the way in time. When you exit the desert, you can either turn right onto a long stretch of highway, or you can go left and go through a small town, then take the back streets to a parallel highway. As I was about to turn right, my brother once again, with that same tone of voice, said to go to the town. Later, he said once again that he saw a line of figures pointing ahead of us, so if we would have gone the other way, we probably wouldn't have made it home in one piece. Thankfully, as we made it farther and farther away and closer to our home, the gut feeling of being watched was going away. And of course, having never experienced something like this before, I was distraught and wanted to talk about it. My brother told me as we were going home that because we were alone, the djinn wanted to mess with us, that they wanted to scare us and most likely cause us harm. 
and that the way they get you into such rural places is to force you to stop and then do whatever they want, which makes sense as to why there were so many animals blocking our path. He also said that they cause bad luck and he could feel them the second we entered the desert, which explains his clumsiness all day and the car that got stuck in such an unusual manner. Because he's my younger brother by three years, any time he had ever told me about this sort of thing before, I always just dismissed it as him scaring himself. I can excuse the sounds we heard and the shadows we saw last night. I can excuse the gut feeling as just being scared, but I cannot excuse the two deer we saw staring right at us, and I cannot excuse the car just randomly fighting against me as I was driving. The deer completely freaked me out, as did the tone of my brother's voice. It's safe to say we're not going camping there again. And it's also safe to say that I will never dismiss my brother when it comes to this kind of thing again. I'm so thankful to God that he was there and that we made it home safely. My parents live in a community in the desert of southwestern United States. After graduating college, I spent some time living at their house, going through the misery of unemployment and applying for jobs. Being away from the city, their neighborhood can get really dark at night, especially when there are clouds or the moon isn't out. This neighborhood has had some issues with the paranormal. People have posted on the Facebook community page, asking if anyone has had strange experiences with the comments on the posts always blowing up with people sharing encounters. Dogs barking and growling at entities not visible in the house, silverware and dishes going missing over time, only to later find it mysteriously in the attic, shadow figures, things like that. One late night, I was alone at their house, watching television. My parents were gone on vacation back east. My parents have this odd cat, who is the living definition of a scaredy cat. Even though it enjoys going outside, the cat won't go unless you're out there with it. If you go back inside, the cat will immediately be cowering in the windows, begging to be let in. As I was watching television, the cat comes darting past my feet to the sliding glass door that opens to the backyard. She was in that low, sneaking position the cats get in when they see something they want to hunt or pounce on. She was frozen, fixated, on something in the back corner of the yard. Out of curiosity of what the cat was seeing, I opened the sliding glass door and let her out. She immediately runs up to the bushes in the corner of the yard and stops, still in the low sneaking position. I walked outside, wondering what in the world was going on. This was one of those dark nights with no moon in the sky, making it difficult to see anything except the outline of the bushes. Suddenly, an orb of bright yellow light flies out of the bushes about the size of a softball. The orb goes up and over the cinder block wall into the neighbor's yard. Both the cat and I jump out of fright. I run back inside, being filled with the familiar dreaded feeling of being around something paranormal. Collecting my courage, I grab a flashlight and I go back out to see if anything's there and to find the cat. I go back to the corner of the backyard, and I see nothing in the bushes where the orb had come out of. I search the whole yard, and I can't find the cat, who was also too little to jump the cinder block walls. The whole time I was outside again just felt wrong, like I shouldn't be there. I went back inside and waited a couple of hours until the cat finally showed up in the windowsill in a state of panic. 
I knew that I saw something with this experience because it was this little weird cat who brought it to my attention. A few days later, my parents are back from their vacation and I tell them about my weird experience. This kind of freaked my mom out, who has read the community Facebook posts about the neighborhood having paranormal activity. Going to bed, I suddenly see a bunch of police cars show up outside the neighbor's house and our house. Police are getting out with their guns drawn. I alert my parents and we lurk in the windows wondering what in the world is happening. I see the next door neighbor girl outside, talking to the police. Nothing really happened except the police searched her house. The next day, my dad calls our neighbor, asking if everything was okay and if they could help. Apparently, their daughter was home alone while they were away. She was walking in the hallway when she saw a black shadowy figure in the house at the end of the hall. She screamed and ran for her phone and called the police. The police searched the house and the surrounding area, but found nobody and didn't find any evidence of a break-in. It was the neighbor's house, their bushes actually, that the orb had flown out of a few nights prior. <laughs> 